shout him out. No, that's my buddy, uh, Auto Flower Podcast. Right on. Well, right before we came live here, I just wanted to do, uh, I guess, take the mic for a second and give uh, Marco a, a shout out with that shirt, man, because I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, shout out to uh, Mr. Chad Westport, as always, uh, finding ways to work uh, Hail Marys here behind the scenes. So uh, IT is on point, videos on point, and our guest is on point today. A lot of people have reached out this week because I feel like, um, you know, there's a there's a small niche of individuals that a lot of people want to learn from. Um, so I wanted to give two shout outs, really. One is to Joey from uh, the Humboldt local. Uh, I, I believe his uh, Instagram was deleted. So, you know, that's some bullshit. Please go follow whatever his new new account is. Uh, but a lot of those individuals that watch that uh, podcast were excited to talk with Todd today uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, not only is he farming, but he's obviously showing off uh, uh, his artwork here. And I feel like it's something that a lot of people crave. I know, uh, including myself, I'm on Instagram every single day. Sad to admit that. Uh, but you don't really post as much as I feel like a lot of people wish you would. Uh, you do the, the stories and that kind of stuff. So I, I encourage, hopefully, that you'll uh, maybe start to post more after I nudge you on that, Todd, because I feel like what you're doing uh, is just part of the community, putting out stuff that, uh, that a lot of people admire. The artwork is there. And you know, today is the platform for you, sir. Uh, shout out to Marco. And uh, I kind of wanted to give Marco the mic because, you know, when he's able to put together guests and reach out and that kind of stuff and just the caliber of individuals that we've been able to have, um, it, it's just really fun to pick your brain. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, once again, uh, thank you, Todd, for, for coming on, man. Um, Todd favorite. is a guy at Resin Ranch. Um, if you guys aren't following him, uh, you really should. Uh, he's uh, one of those guys that... Um, I, I picked to be on the show. I'm, I'm kind of biased. Uh, I pick guys which I feel are elite on a high level. Um, and to be honest with you guys, I mean, I'm a grower from way back, as everyone knows. Um, and I haven't really dabbled a whole lot into the, um, you know, extracts part of it. You know what I mean? And one reason being, um, I dabbled with it in the past, never really found a, a process that I felt was like super clean. Um, so didn't really do much with it. And, um, through the course of Instagram, I came up, uh, upon resin ranches, uh, IG. And I tell you, um, the process from A to Z that he does is awesome. Um, it's super clean and we're going to let him explain, uh, explain what he's doing. And then I'm just going to, uh, just kind of be a noob about it, man. And ask, um, ask questions Please. along the way that I think a lot of our, um, our folks will want to learn. I uh, want to know the answers to. And, um, and yeah, so why don't you just kind of tell everybody about yourself, Todd? And um, I come to find out you're a contractor. And um, it seems like a lot of the guys I, I seem to gravitate towards are also uh, contractors such as myself, man. So why don't you tell people about yourself, man, and we'll kind of, you know, get into it. Yeah, uh, I guess I'll kind of start from the beginning. I'm Todd, Resin Ranch Extraction. Uh in a past life, I've been carpenter, snowboard bum, uh, weed grower, hash maker, you name it. Uh, kind of my backstory in the industry is I was in Wisconsin doing the construction thing, running my own business, doing, you know, some small basement growth, wink, wink, and uh, had a friend from California come visit and uh was looking for some smoke. So I gave him some smoke and instantly he knew like, bro, you're growing. It's obvious. There's nothing like this in Wisconsin and totally talked me into coming out to California to help them start a delivery service in the Sacramento area, which long story short did not work out. Uh, he did talk me into giving up the construction company, coming out here to chase what I've always wanted to grow big trees in Northern California. I used to watch the Jorge Cervantes videos of Joey back in the day, never ever imagining that, that that's where I would end up. But, uh, you know, I got out here, I kind of started the hash thing, uh, pretty early for non-solvent. That would have been back in 2015. I was trying to get, uh, non-solvent, uh, rosin into clubs in Sacramento and 90% of the clubs I went into had never heard of it yet, had no idea what it was. It was kind of a very slow going thing at first. And, uh, I ended up running into Joey through a mutual friend 
And he initially was like, okay, this guy makes hash. This would be a cool thing to have around. And he's a contractor, perfect person to run a grow in California, Northern California. Cause at the end of the day, growing the weed is such a small part of what you have to do to run, you know, a size farm we were doing that was 10,000 square feet of canopy back then that I was running just the two of us, mostly me doing the labor. And, uh, <clears throat> Where do I go from there? Oh yeah. And we just, you know, decided we're going to, we're going to get into this, start doing it. Went for the permits. I got my fiance who we just got married this morning. Actually, my wife now, <laughs> uh, helped us get permitted and everything. Uh, we went to Emerald cup in 2016 would have been the year I wanted first and second for dry sift and ended up getting disqualified 10 days later because they never ran all the testing before they ran the competition. Um, we did spray Pyganic that year. We had russet mites. It was the first year we ever had russet mites. Nobody really even knew how to deal with them back then. Um, so, oh, excuse me, we did, you know, what everybody back then would do, be spray some pyrethrin on them. And we eventually got through it. We won first and second, got that taken away, but we took it on the chin like champs. We never, ever said that we were trying to do anything fishy. We had the conversation knowing that like we, we could very well get DQ'd. We didn't have time to run our own testing before the competition. Never expecting that they would run a competition, give out awards, do interviews, magazine interviews, newspaper interviews to then you know, yank it out from underneath you, but is what it is. The community really kind of, that's where I got a lot of respect from a lot of people in the industry because we didn't pull the like, Oh, we didn't do anything. You know, like we just, we took it on the chin. We were honest about what happened. We were honest about what we did the next year. We were very transparent on how we ran the farm. We did a no spray that season on 10,000 square feet of canopy. And we pulled in a clean crop. So we quickly turned things around. Um, the first year with Joey, we just kind of, you know, it was amended soil, some teas, nothing too complicated. And my second full season with him was when he started doing the KNF stuff. And I had basically a boss who was coming up to the farm, you know, maybe once a week and he would drop off all this like milk and rice and all this stuff and be like, all right, this is what we're going to do with this. And I'm just like, what the hell is this guy like lost his mind? Like what's going on here? But it was like, yo, you got to go watch these Chris Trump videos and, you know, get an idea of what you were doing. And I was definitely the kind of person that loved to uh, get into a new style of growing. And I, I learned most of what I learned on the forums back in the days where everybody was sharing information and it was kind of just propping everybody up. So I went and I watched a bunch of Chris Trump videos and I was like, okay, this is very interesting stuff. You know, I was, it was my first year going to be like percent on the farm. So I was like, oh yeah, you know, any penny we can save ends up going into my pocket. So I just kind of dove head in first with them and we started chopping up apples and pears and making Jadam ferments. We did the master Cho style with the sugar um both he and i i think quickly adapted to the jadam style just because we realized quickly we that was something we would be able to scale up to actually be able to manage ten thousand square feet on that where the master cho with all the sugar and everything really personally to me to run at scale is very hard i mean i found myself mixing ferments more than I was actually taking care of plants or with the Jadam style, we would go grab a pickle barrel, throw a bunch of stuff in it, some leaf mold, some water, throw the lid on and boom, seven to 10 days later, it was ready to go. And, uh, we, that year we did do, we did amend soil and then we got into the K and F and long story short, the amendments that we bought weren't going to make it all the way through the season. Plants started to yellow before, Things started transitioning and stuff like that. So I took a row down in the lower garden by the house and I started going heavy on just the KNF stuff, just the Jadam stuff we were making. And within two weeks, I had these plants fully green and lush again. And that's where I was like, okay, I don't need to see any science behind this. 
most stuff in cannabis is anecdotal and we latch on to styles of doing things because we see firsthand that it works. And I saw firsthand how well it was working. So ever since then, I mean, I, I do multiple styles. I am, you know, I'll, I'll run some stuff more dry amendments. I'll run some, some stuff more KNF, but it's always at this point, it's always part of my feed regiment. Um, especially making hash. I feel like, you really can pull some more terps out of your cannabis doing the KNF feedings versus anything else that I've tried personally. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the farm farm background. Unfortunately, 2017 was the year everything just tanked like it did this year. We were trying to do everything above board because we had just gotten a permit. Um, foolishly i'm gonna say now trying to do everything above board back then you know we all thought that this was going to be a great system and we'd be able to get product into the market and we'd be able to move it and we all know now years later that that's just not the reality and that most of it yeah it just sits and rotting if you try to do it all above board so now everybody's backdooring stuff but we weren't in that position uh he was in the middle of a divorce so it was time for us to kind of go our separate ways we've obviously remained very good friends to see each other all the time um i kind of went left the farm and focused more on just doing the resin ranch thing so i started finding farmers like abr who's another one that's big into knf i don't know if you guys have heard of him or follow him uh did a lot of work with him and then you know, had a little spot with a buddy of mine in Laytonville that we kind of really helped Resin Ranch get going and keep going. And it got to a point now where I was able to buy my own property this year up Grass Valley. So now we're, me and my wife are on five acres out here doing our own little thing, uh, keeping the dream alive and just trying to, you know, keep the hash going. And at this point, I feel like I'm leaning more towards educational stuff trying to spread that knowledge because for me this information was all free nobody hoarded this stuff back in the day matt rise put tutorials up on roll it up bubble man had his youtube videos if you watch those you you know and then you start putting it to practice you start figuring things out and as far as i'm concerned the information's out there i would love we need to put more information out there because in this industry Education is key. Education is key. If your EndNote user knows what the process is and what goes into it, they are more likely to pay the prices that most people would like to see, especially on the legal side of things. And they can trust the product. Um, I did do PHO for a while. And when I found non-solvent, that was just like, okay, this makes sense. I'm going through all this effort to grow these plants clean, do all this organic stuff, you know, not make my soil toxic. And then I'm going to dump chemicals over it. You know, it didn't really make sense to me. So getting into the water hash was kind of a natural transition, I guess, for mm -hmm. somebody like me who was big into concentrates. So, yeah, I mean, that's yeah. kind of the backstory there. <laughs> yeah, that's cool, man. Um, so, yeah, I mean you, that was that was that was a lot. Um, yeah, shout out to Joey, man, great guy. That's pretty cool that you guys pass, um, you know, crossed like they did at that time, and you guys still remain friends. Um, and I, and uh, another thing, um, getting back to where you said the um, when you working with the Jadam inputs, you notice the big difference in the terps. That's something that that I always preach. Like I always say that, like you said, anecdotally, like not necessarily testing it. But I mean, there's something about man just using the natural farm and inputs that to me, I feel like you just it brings out just that little bit more, you know what I mean, than you would be absolutely. getting from anything else, you know. I absolutely and it, it you know, to somebody like me, I've always I always gravitated towards, you know, I guess you could say the organic method, which is almost becoming a dirty word, but I've, I've always been an outside person. I you know, graduated high school. I went and I was a snowboard bum. I was outside all the time. I worked outside in construction for 20 years. So for me, being outdoors has always been a big thing. It's never a place I wanted to trash. So to me, doing it 
like you say, from inputs around your property just makes it feel better too, to me. And that I think in cannabis, especially as a crop, what you put into it personally, I feel like comes out on the other side, your attitude going into it comes out on the other side. Um, when I talk about testing, it's more like actually testing the products we're making to see what is in there, who I know some people now that have this past year and everything that we think is in there and more. <laughs> so it, what ratios that could change, obviously, but we did a lot of testing on our flower that we grew KNF. And what we saw from strains that had been grown in the past is we saw a noticeable increase in THC and in terpenes. Now, for me, I could care less what the THC number is, but in this market, that's everything. So that's a good thing. And then terpenes, another thing, if you can increase, I mean, it's all terps now, terps, terps, terps. It's got to have terpenes, you know? So those are like two positive effects that are like, you know, it's hard to beat those two because that's what everybody looks for, I guess, is the point I'm trying to make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, man. Um, and just to kind of give a little bit of overview of your kind of your grows before we, you know, get too deep into it. So you grow outdoor. I know you have the outdoor space and then you also grow indoor. Um, do you grow indoor all year or do you grow kind of outdoor when it's, you know, summer and then indoor? So in the, winter? The, the indoor thing for me is kind of kind of new. I've always done it. Well, you know, I, came, I learned in Colorado, basically. Uh, one of my good friends was one of the first 250 people to get a medical card in Colorado. So we started with like, you know, uh, closets in the bedroom with, you know, fart fans from bathrooms to vent them kind of thing. And it just kind of snowballed from there. When I was in Wisconsin, I was doing, you know, vented rooms in the basements. And then when I moved out to California, I didn't touch any indoor setup for until what, probably 2019 or so, I start, moved down to Sebastopol and I started working pretty close with Book Sauce Winery. I don't know if you guys have heard of him. He's another groovy hash maker. Um, I started working with him. We started doing some, uh, I, we kind of shared a washroom. Uh, he had a spot down there and he was spread really thin with getting his uh, fully melted going, which is his uh, rec hash brand, which is a pretty good one. And, uh, for rec hash brands, it's great. Actually, I have to say not pretty good and, uh, started working with him and he was, I just was watching him get, you know, dragged in too many directions to really make things work well for him. So I was like, Hey, you want to, let's split this spot for a little while and, you know, kind of take some of the load off of your back. It's going to help me out a little bit and got to start doing this little about 20 lights with him. And then, uh, yeah, when I got this spot, you know, we, we just have a small little nine lights, but it keeps my goal with the indoor being a hash maker. I like to put out full melt, which can definitely be done from outdoor. It's just a lot more difficult. And if we have, you know, like a bad fire season, that's pretty much, you're not going to be pulling hash. That's clean enough to go to full melt. It's all going to have to get put to rosin. So my goal was to this last year was to scale down a little bit, focus more on consistently pull it, putting out a six star full melt product as well as the rosin. So being able to do both and have the indoor going year round, we do do it year round. Uh, at least this year we did keeps, you know, I don't just have that one big dump at the in you know, the end of the year, I have something to kind of sustain me plus keep the full melt going. Um, this season, we may not do a summer run on the indoor just to take away some of the extra work on our end because it's just me and my girl. I mean, we have one guy, that wife. We, my wife, sorry, That's you right. calling her my girl now. She's my <laughs> wife. Uh, we have one guy that comes in pretty sporadically to help with harvest. But other than that, it's me and her. We do every step of everything. So having the outdoor come down, having the indoor come down. And then by the time you're done with the outdoor, cause that actually takes about a whole month cause everything's not done at once. All of a sudden you've got another indoor coming down. So it's like this just insane harvest, 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 not even any really time to get any washes in or anything else. So 
this year, the way the calendar is falling, I think we may end up very well just not doing that run in the middle of summer. So we're not double harvesting, <laughs> but yeah, All we right. do, we run the, do the indoor. Um, this will be like my third run here. So I'm still really dialing things in. We're kind of my goal with this one was to definitely be on LED, not to HID. And we're seeing a huge, huge difference in power consumption doing that. And eventually I kind of run my indoor a little bit different than my outdoor. I kind of run the indoor a little more, uh, like dry soluble products. I do add ferments and teas, but I try to not do as much as I do outdoor. Uh, it could, it's, you know, personal reasons. They could all be wrong. I don't know. I just, I don't, I don't want to just start bringing all of that stuff inside to what I consider a semi sterile environment when it comes to indoor, but we do, we do amended soil. Uh, we do the organics alive, which is a pretty groovy product. Uh, it's a zero waste facility. It's a fermented product. Um, and then I'll do my apple ferment. I have a pumpkin and squash ferment that I do for that one. And we always do cannabis ferment through every stage of growth. We have a veg one and we have a transition and we have a flower finisher that I always try to keep going. And we'll do that, you know, probably twice in veg and twice in flower. <clears throat> but other than that, it's mostly organics alive. The goal eventually would probably be like no till beds indoor but being you know still this kind of new to indoor it makes me a little hesitant just because if i've had some soil problems this year for the people that follow no we got a bad batch like if that had happened in beds it would have been so much harder to deal with than in pots and i was able to actually just replant the pot the plants into different pots with different soil and save everything so I'm still just a little hesitant on possibly running into a soil issue in beds indoor and then just having to completely redo everything, you know? So we're still kind of dialing in our style there. That's Let's cool. kind Let of the industry one. secret real quick, Marco, with, right. the, with the soil that doesn't work out. Um, I feel like a lot of commercial farmers, maybe they don't admit it like you just did, but it it causes a lot of problems for people that might not necessarily know, get a large commercial size order of soil. Um, you know, you are trying to make moves, maybe uh, go with somebody you've never run with before. Uh, and it just is a nightmare to fix. So um, I, I was hoping maybe we could talk about that. That's why I kind of jumped in there because I didn't yeah. want to lose train of thought on that because I do feel like a lot of people want to get to your position, want to get to Marco's position of being able to farm on your location um, and, you know, kudos to, you know, not only getting married, but at the same time, you know, taking the t maybe a step back so that you can own what you what you're doing. And I feel like that is really at the end of the day, the the, the real big difference It's kind of like artists not owning their the rights to their music. I feel like a lot of you guys out there with the talent, uh, you have to you have to find somebody that's got, you know, the suits and the, that mindset or it's really hard to to make it on on your own. So I just wanted to jump in with that, man, because I feel like if you could kind of talk about the soils and maybe we could talk about that a little bit, because that is one of the behind the scenes a lot of people bitch about and really no one ever talks about or brings it up because uh, I probably for a variety of reasons. Yeah. Hey, Ty, as you. As you go, go into the soil, one one thing I wanted to also jump in on a, before we lose the train of thought. Um, everyone wants to know outdoor versus indoor. You run a lot of the same strains, uh, quality wise on on the final product. What's your what's your take? And you, then you can uh, go on into soil from there. My my honest opinion, uh, and and the feedback I get from most of my clients and customers is it, there's really no discernible difference. Nine out of ten, 10 times, they're probably going to pick the outdoor over the indoor. It's reality. You cannot beat the sun. I mean, <laughs> all the lighting technology in the world is never going to match the sun. And that, that different UV spectrums. I mean, we used to try and run UV lights back in the day, indoor all the time, trying to get more resin and more flavor. It's right outside your door. It's always there. <laughs> And it, it does its job well. Mother Nature has adapted for eons before us. We are foolish to think we can do any better. The only difference on the indoor is the cleanliness of the melt for full melt. And 
maybe the color on you know the finished product though it's interesting doing competitions where you will have indoor and outdoor next to each other being judged majority of the time the indoor wins which is weird to me because most of the feedback i get and the real people the heads that really know that do both like west coast alchemy runs more material than probably anybody as far as non-solvent will tell you that outdoor is king when it comes to non-solvent hash it just is but it's weird how the indoor always wins the competition you know what i'm saying and and i'm glad that at eagle clash this year it was a full term outdoor for maine that won like i'm super proud that that that's the way that went down as an outdoor guy but yeah, I mean, I, I, I like I say, I'm kind of I tell people it just in all honesty that like I'm kind of stuck in this weird place where like the value on things because of what they cost to grow, the indoor should cost a little more. You know, it's that's just the realities of overhead. But the I, I can't charge more because the outdoor is a little bit better, <laughs> you know, so it's like it's a it's kind of a weird subject to talk about you know but in all honesty i'll take the outdoor every day yeah everybody that's everyone's always asking that question so i'm just wondering from your point of view man makes a lot of sense mm -hmm. figure the sun the sun you can't beat the sun even though some of these new lighting companies man they're they're tuning the spectrums and it's they're getting closer but uh, you'll never match the sun it, it's you know? still an artificial light source correct you know so all and i and i and I think there's it's more there's more you know I always tell people not to get sidetracked a little bit but indoor guys that come outdoor I always tell them you need to forget everything you learned inside there's so much more to the outdoor than just what's the light schedule what's the light spectrum you know those plants are are spending months out there. They set, They know the days are getting longer. They know the days are getting shorter. They see the sun getting more orange in the winter. You know, there's just the temperature changes. There's just so much more to it than just, we change the light schedule. They're going to flower. You know, it's, I just thought there's a, the whole symbiotic relationship of mother nature and she knows what to do. We don't need to tell her what to do. She's going to do the right thing every time, you know? So I tell these guys like, Oh, but the light hours don't matter. Don't worry about the light hours. Like it, it, cannabis is going to flower outside as pretty much as soon as it hits 14 hours of light. Like it's going to probably start pushing. So forget the 12, 12 thing, forget the 18, six thing, you know, and just understand that there's so many more things that you just don't have any control over that are actually working in your advantage. I feel. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, it, here's a new mistake for, from an indoor guy that went outdoors this year when Virginia went legal. Um, never been able to grow outdoors, you know, so get get these plants ready indoors. Nice, fat little bushes, you know, I'm ready to go. You know, it warms up in April, nice and warm here in Virginia. So I start putting them out on my deck. Well, didn't consider the sun hours hadn't... Um, hadn't gotten long enough yet yep. so these babies went into flower and um you know it was a new yep. mistake but that you know it luckily it was just on a couple plants but that's something like you said man there's a lot of variables with going outside and things people don't always think of it it is a new mistake but it also isn't there is a lot and this is where cannabis to do to do both and to do both well takes some intuition takes some natural ability and you need to be able to like think rationally about these things of like what why did it flower okay because the light hours are different so if you're going to be bringing stuff from indoor to outdoor you want to treat those different like look at look at you know the light hours during the summer your longest day you're never going to hit 18 hours of light so basically anything you take from indoors that's 18 hours of light, if you just take it outside, it's going to flower probably. Ah, because of the, the, because the shorter the, duration you know, right away. Yeah, you're immediately dropping three hours of light, basically. So you can, you can keep things in veg indoor under like 15, 16 hours of light. So if you do the 15, 16 hour veg, then you can bring them outside and you don't really have to worry about transitioning them off, which is another thing that there's so many factors that go into running a good outdoor scene because most people aren't doing their clones outside. 
They aren't vegging their plants outside, especially for their first step round. Most of those are done inside and then brought outside. So there's ways you can manipulate things on the indoor that then you can transition to outside and not have those that two week loss to hardening it off to light or hardening it off to temperature. You know, you can set up a hoop outside with a heater in it and put lights in it. So you're not changing the light schedule yet, but you're hardening them off to temperature. So then when you lose the plastic and the lights, it's just light they're hardening off to now. So there's a lot of, a lot of details that go into it that like, I try to tell people I've worked with in the past that it's, it's hard for me to even get it out of my head and explain it to people sometimes how many different details I'm thinking about and planning for on every grow. It, it's a little exhausting sometimes, but I, I mean, I love to do it and it, it's just, it is what it is. So just to recap on that, if you, you want to go from indoor to outdoor, lose it all <laughs> and kind of start from scratch, I feel is the best. That's a great, that's great advice. And one thing I even want to step farther to that is I said, okay, well, my next outdoor run, I got my light timed where it's kind of coordinating with the outdoor light. So a lot of times we tend to want our lights on at, in the, at night because it's yep. summertime, it's hot. So I kind of yep. did the opposite. I got my schedule pretty much when sun up starts. That's kind of when my veg plants are on their schedule. So that, that transition will just be one less step. One know? less step. Yep. And you're gonna you're gonna learn that there's certain things that will work well for you that might not work well for others because of your area. Like Virginia, what part of Virginia? And just out of curiosity, because I have an uncle in Virginia. I'm in uh, Richmond area, zone seven. Richmond, okay. Uh, yeah, he was a lifelong Navy boy. You know, I I really couldn't even begin to tell you what days you need to start your season, when you need to end your season. Your light schedule when I start my season may be different, a little bit different than it is here. Probably not much because they're probably not that much different in the Northern Hemisphere. But the angle of the sun will make a difference. Some plants, you they could be getting enough light hours, but the angle of the sun's low enough that they're just going to instantly be like, oh, we're losing sun. We're going to start flowering. And it's obviously very strain dependent, too. Some strains can handle that, you know, way different light schedule getting thrown at them and still know what to do. Others don't. So, yeah, there's definitely always got to think about, you know, the do I need to run lights outside? Would, would your neighbors be calling the cops on you immediately in Virginia doing that? You know, no, nah, we're not as bad now, man. We we've gone legal. You know, you can have your four plants per residence and yada, yada, yada. But yeah, people have been pretty, pretty chill about it. That's good. Cause you know, around here, there's so many people that they grow that not, you know, you have to think about light pollution and That's true. you know, it might not be an issue say where I lived in Wisconsin. Cause you know, it's all oh, the friend, you know, Todd's got his lights back porch light on all the time. What do you do? But when all your neighbors have their back porch light on all the time and you're the one neighbor that does it, oh, you're going to start picking up the phone and, you know, calling the authorities. So, you know, we have to think about light pollution and it's one reason personally that I don't, I don't like to depth as much as I like to grow full term. I don't like having to mess with all that you know, messing with the light schedules, pulling tarp, worrying about light pollution and pulling tarp just to run supplemental lights. Like people don't realize that that's a thing. We don't just run the tarp to block the sun out. We run the tarp to keep the lights, the neighbors from seeing the lights sometimes, you know? So it's like, you're not actually just pulling tarp for those 60 days. You're pulling tarp for the whole crop. So it's like four months. You know? Yeah, I've kind of made my mind up. I don't want to mess with depth because one reason here in Virginia are it's hot as hell, humid as hell. Um, I'm just going to run full term and let it go. Um, trying to run a you know light deprivation in this kind of heat. And yeah, it could be very be, difficult. Yeah, and then you might you probably would find that you'd have a lot of strains that would just harm on you because of the mm -hmm. heat and humidity. Uh, yeah, it's probably really nice when you har are harvesting full terms in like October or November though. Yeah, it's real nice, man. We look for like a real late um, flower and sativa here because our, we stay mild really long. Um, like even just last week, it was like 70, but oh, you wow. know, that, that fades in and out 
But yeah. yeah, definitely, man. It's nice late October, you know, still going sometimes into November. Yeah, if you're in a place that you can go into November, you know, it should be it should be pretty easy. You know, like I'm from Wisconsin. I I talked to some guys back there that, you know, do some quote unquote hemp <laughs> in greenhouses. Mm -hmm. And I tell them all the time, like, I do not envy you guys. Like, it's got to be so difficult because it's hot and humid like Virginia. And then come september even early october i mean the weather just starts falling apart you lose all the sun it starts getting cold it's really humid i mean they just, it's just i would imagine mold 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 pm 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 unhappy plants just not easy to pull in and that's you know it's a huge factor of outdoors what your mi microclimate is like what it's like at harvest you know i i was in mendo where Come October, it starts getting really cold and wet. And I'm over here in Grass Valley where it starts to cool it all, cool off, but it stays quite a bit warmer and it stays really dry. So like Mendo, you know, to dry some cannabis, you got to be running these huge D hums and heaters and all this stuff over here. You can just put it in a closed space with no heat and it basically stays a perfect 60-60. So it's like, <laughs> you know, finishing full term over here is a breeze compared to where I was in Mendo, you know, in Virginia, it sounds like it's probably pretty favorable too, you know? Yeah, it is. It's, um, it's great weather. Um, dad, uh, had his first outdoor harvest, um, uh, some cuts I gave him and, um, him and his buddy ran them and everything. And they did pretty good. And, um, he was dry and he's like, man, I don't know what's going on. We got some mold going on. And I'm, and I'm like, well, when did you cut? Well, they cut when it was raining. So, you know what I mean? There's just little things. Um, you know, it's kind of cool seeing that man. That man's, you know, up in his years and yeah, that's enjoying awesome. It. Yeah, making mistakes and learning. He's like, man, I need to watch your show a little bit more and stuff like that. So I think it's pretty cool. And, and I try to tell these guys, <laughs> all these, because my DMs always just full of, you know, questions, questions. Everybody thinks I'm going to be able to solve their problem you know, with one sentence for me personally, the only way I learn is to do it and mess it up. It really is. I can, I can watch a million things and I can do it like that and have success, but I'm never going to fully understand why I'm doing what I'm doing until I mess it up and I have to fix it. And I have to go through that learning process of figuring out what I messed up why it messed up the plant, what it is that the plant doesn't like about what I did, and then backtrack and be able to fix that. That is the best way to learn. So I, I always tell people, and this is what I was told right away too, it's just a plant. Do not forget at the end of the day that it's just a plant. A lot of times we put our health on the line, we put our safety on the line, and all this crap for a plant. If you miss a harvest, because you messed up, it's not a wasted harvest. You just learned incredibly valuable lessons that you can bring on to the next one that you probably will never lose a harvest again for that reason. I can guarantee that, you know? So I always try to tell people, don't look at it as a loss. Look at it as a learning, a learning opportunity because it, those lessons stick with you that, oh, we harvested in the rain, everything molded in the dry room. You're never going to do that again. I guarantee it. <laughs> you know, you'll make the decision. I'm going to let it go through the rain, then deal with it. It might not look as good and I might not get as much for it, but those are decisions that have to be made. Or, or even it's, catch it the day before the rain. Or even catch it the day before, which is, you know, it's watch the weather. And another thing I tell people is be prepared. Don't, don't wait till the rain comes in October to support your plants. You know, simple as that. Don't wait until the PM comes to get some sort of preventative treatment on your plant. Don't wait till the bugs show up to start doing IPM. It's stay ahead of the curve, be prepared, and be prepared for the worst because <laughs> it most likely will happen. You had mentioned basically like you're learning from your experience, and that's why I wanted to kind of talk about that soil experience that you had. Yeah. Because if that, that happens well. to you on the commercial level, you might not get a second chance. Uh, that that learning chance might you might be gone. Uh, so those yeah. were some of the things that I kind of wanted to dive into. Is when something is fucked up, when you when you've committed, obviously you got a ton of soil, and things start to go south real quick. 
what are some ways that you found since you do have a skill set in indoor and outdoor where you're able to manage uh, or, or fix uh, issues like that? Uh, well, there's, you know, there's obviously only so many issues you're going to be able to fix. So I guess I can get, I mean, somebody talk for me quick. I got to make sure I didn't lose my speaker. Yeah, we're here, man. Can you hear us? Hold on. I got a bad connector on my phone here. There we go. I was muted. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, now it's better. Uh, so really all I can, you know, I can use this, this summer's experience is what I can really talk the best on. Uh, I'm just trying to decide whether how much of this I should divulge and how much I should keep to myself. Um, and not for me, but to, but I don't want to, I don't want to slander anybody in this is what I'm saying because I was treated right in the end. So we're just going to leave the company name out of it. Uh, company A. Company A. They are a trusted company in cannabis. Uh, just be real that 2020 was not good to any small business. And they had to find, you know, outsource some new products. And they had to find uh, new people to mix and stuff like that. So we got the soil. Uh, when we purchased it, we were told, you know, it's not our normal mix. The perlite is different. Um, it's not as high in nitrogen as it usually is. And it's pretty high in phosphorus. So being a weed girl, I'm like, okay, pretty easy. I'll throw some compost in there. I'll throw some chicken manure at it. Uh, the phosphorus shouldn't be too much of an issue. And when I hit flower, hopefully there's still some extra phosphorus there and it's just going to end up doing good for me to, put those plants we planted out the indoor and ordered uh so we bought bag soil for the indoor and then we got bulk soil for the outdoor ordered them both at the same time planted the indoor and within 24 hours i knew we had a major problem like it was obvious these plants were green they were healthy and in a day and a half went yellow from dirt to tip like bad Whoa started throwing as much nitrogen at it as I could and it did nothing. So that went on for about four days, which normally isn't enough time for me to say, all right, we're going to give up on something. But my experience told me there's no way I'm fixing this. I cannot get nitrogen into these plants to then get a call from company A being like, oh, we got another soil test back and it's much worse than we thought. It's toxic levels of boron and potassium and not a lick of nitrogen because that boron and potassium is making that completely unavailable. No matter, pretty much no matter what you throw at this, you're not going to correct it. So it's like, okay, well, I, I already made the decision at that point that I was just going to pull the plants out that were in the pots on the indoor, shake off as much dirt as I can and replant them. That worked pretty well. We had already planted the outdoor, which immediately pretty much started doing the same thing so without before they even told me that we had made the decision we're just pulling this soil like this is this is not worth messing with i, I still have plants i could save so it wasn't in a position of like i'm gonna just have to lose everything and start over so we just threw it into a pile uh we we dug out a bunch of 200 gallon smart pots <laughs> put it into a pile, refilled it with new soil, uh, planted, did a fat tea to get a bunch of microbiology in there to help them kind of correct the crap that had been going on. And they turned around pretty quick. The indoor did not turn around as quick. Some of them just really kind of never got over that toxic level of boron. They just kind of stayed funky the whole grow that we, you know, we harvested and it was all good. And that's the hash that I got fifth at Eagle Clash with was from that grow. So that was kind of that experience. Now, I was treated, I think, better than some other companies were because I wasn't the only one that got bad soil. But I'm one of the few people that got bad soil that has 25, 30,000 followers. So they were quickly on my phone to be like, yo, we'll give you store credit, all that stuff. 
and they've been great since then. We got store credit. Um, they've fixed their soil since then. We've tested it since then. Everything is good. I'm going to continue to still work with said company because I like them personally. Um, I think that they, at least with me and the few other people I know, they handled the situation good. Uh, like anything, you're going to hear people in the DM talking crap and rumors and so-and-so got burnt and so-and-so got burnt and maybe they did, maybe they didn't. I don't know. Maybe they didn't make the decision they needed to quick enough and they lost their whole season. Um, but I'm going to keep working with them because they were they were honest about it from day one. They just didn't realize it was as bad as it was. So that type of soil situation, I don't think there's any amending or watering your way out of. Um, I wish it's something, the whole like soil and bad soil and what to do if something goes wrong, I think was, I wish was talked about more in the industry. I feel like you see a lot of the large indoor grows, they just don't use soil. Um, I'm going to guess when you're running multiple hundred lights, they probably have a good reason for it. It's probably just easier to maintain and to keep clean. Uh, the problem I see with a lot of store-bought soil is you're going to get something. You're going to get fungus gnats. You're going to get root aphids. It's it's a guarantee. There's And there's kind of no way you can't, especially if you look at the storage yards and they're all just sitting on pallets outside, not really covered. Yeah, there's going to be insects laying eggs in there. So what to do when you get a problem? I mean, I guess that's really specific to what the problem is and what your situation is. Did they say how the um, how the boron got to those toxic levels, man? Did they have any indication of what happened? It had to be something to do with the, the new company they had mixing the soil. Just an imbalance mix somewhat too much but of I one think ingredient. It, it seemed like it happened with multiple companies unless this happened on a huge scale from this one company, but from behind the scenes. And that's why I kind of wanted to jump at the chance to, to talk about this is because so many people, uh, this is how they make money for themselves. This is how yeah. they take care of themselves. Sometimes even, you know, family members and stuff need whatever medicine you're providing. And then the time it takes to figure sometimes this out when you're learning how to do things and realize yeah, it's, it's not even you. Yeah. So there's that, a lot of people out there that are going to, I feel like, uh, resonate with the, with this part of the program. And, and here's another thing I want to talk about that I don't, I don't think a lot of people talk about. And I used to ride pretty high and mighty on my horse, too, when I first got into this. That like, you know, oh, if you have a problem, like, you just got to start over. Okay, that was before I understood that some people have a quarter million invested into the grow every time. That's before I realized that some people have to put up a million dollars every season just to get the grow going. So, you know, people don't really talk about this a lot, but for a lot of people nowadays with where the price is, starting over and losing a crop isn't an option. It isn't. So... Let's say, for instance, you get you, you you just get PM'd out. You're just white from corner to corner of the field. Well, let's just be honest that that's what happened, and let's send it to a product that it can be dealt with. Like BHO isn't my first choice, but they have the technology and the means to filter that stuff out and still have a clean product. And that farmer still has something to be able to get that income back, at least break even or get close to break even or make something. So, you know, a lot of people want to get high and mighty and, oh, I saw a spot of PM on so-and-so's plant. And like, yo, get over yourself, dude. Like, first of all, there's no perfect situation. The perf world's not perfect. There's no perfect people. And you have to understand what some people put in to make this happen. And that, that crop literally could be their whole livelihood. Pulling anything in is what could get them to the next crop that then may get them to the point where they're paying bills again. That's the unfortunate reality of cannabis nowadays and where the prices are. Yeah, I want to see the end user get, you know, a fair price on things. But let's be honest, if you're talking about the white market, the savings aren't being passed on to the end user. In the traditional market, the savings aren't being passed on to the end user. 
I'm just going to be completely fucking honest out here. I hope I can swear. People are getting hit over the head right now for seven, $800 pounds. Those are still going back East and get broke down into eights and quarters sold for 50 and a hundred. And they're turning them into $6,400 pounds. Yep. Let's fucking be real about that. Who's making all the money who deserves to be making all the money. That cannabis doesn't exist without your farmer period. So I was, Hey, I was sick to know that like the dispensary, um, just an eighth, say 60 bucks. The farmer gets like $15. If that, dude, if they're lucky that de- that's going to depend on how many times they had to pay taxes. If their distro is maybe going to pay taxes on one of those. I mean, it's insane. And it's in both markets. Let's, I mean, the, the, the traditional market does a lot better. There's, there's no doubt about that, but somewhere along the line, the people that aren't taking all the risk and that aren't putting up all the money are making all the money. And your farmers are just losing out. And and why do you think big ag is taking over cannabis and big corporations? Because there's no little guys left anymore. They're all getting squeezed out, selling pounds for 700 bucks for somebody to break them down and make $5,500 on it. Well, I, I feel from my experience, seeing the more traditional market to the to the actual commercial market, the traditional market takes care of itself. It kind of weeds out certain individuals. People don't fuck exactly. with these individuals anymore because people are looking out yep. for each other. Or now, the, on the flip side of things, you fuck somebody over, and, I, and this is the other thing that kind of sucks about our industry, too, is I, I feel like it's no one wants to talk about that stuff. They almost feel ashamed that somebody did this or did that to them. Uh, but the reality is, is there's a lot of uh, Fugazi type individuals that have been um, kind of going around the country and, and talking about a variety of different things. And I, 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 I don't know, I guess I'm kind of on my high horse on this for a second um, when you were talking about that is because I, I do feel like the respect part of things. We have to we have to as a community find a way to have the respect part of the traditional market find its way into the commercial market. Otherwise, all of the small time guys are going to get fucked over because we're all fucking each other over behind the scenes. And then when they do go talk to the suits, they either sell out for the bigger hoodie type brands um, or those two, uh, you know, a lot of times behind the scenes, those two end up fucking each other over before anything even happens. So it's just like continuing stuff of where on our side of things, we continue to fuck it up. Um, And and I feel like that's because of lack of the respect. I feel like that was usually given to people where, um, hey, you're feeding my family. I'm feeding your family. Let's make sure this train doesn't stop moving. Yeah. And and I mean, maybe it's a generational thing. I mean, I don't I don't want to necessarily say it is, but like (laughs) I see so many times business relationships go south over the most foolish thing or one of them get greedy and rip the other one off when it's like, dude, okay, you just ripped me off for a stack. We could have made six figures over the next six months together. But you want to get greedy over this one little thing. Like, where's the teamwork? Where's the support? It, it used to be there in the forum days. It was there when I first got to humble Mendo, it was still there. Like neighborhoods would get together and like, yo, not a pound leaves this hill under this price this year. And if you do, all those guys were at your property asking why, and you better have a damn good reason, you know? And even just since I got here in 2015, I know they talk about, you know, the, the out of towners and I'm an out of towner, but at least I came here with some respect. I feel like a lot of people have come out here and it was easy for them. So they don't have that respect for it because it was just, Oh, I had, you know, I had a trust fund. Boom. I bought a warehouse. It was super easy. I never got in any trouble, you know, cause nowadays like you, you don't get arrested for a hundred lights. You pay a fine. It's a compliance fine. Compliance board comes by, they give you $10,000 for, cultivation they give you a fine for unpermitted electrical and they're happy to come back and do it again and not arrest you because of the revenue so you know even though i didn't do it here i did a lot of it in a time and in a state where if i had gotten busted with those two lights i'd have been doing 10 years minimum you know so like the respect is there the respect has to be there otherwise we're i mean we're witnessing what happens when it's not the backstabbing the trying to get over on everybody, 
And, you know, I think everybody right now is so scared of like really cornering their market and making sure that their corner of the market is good because of other states coming online and stuff like that. But it's like, dude, there's, there's still plenty of room for everybody. Plenty, you know, especially especially when you focus on quality. Yeah. And that's the key word. If you focus on quality right now, we are in the middle of, and I I hear it over and over again. I'm going to grow more. I'm just going to grow more next year. I heard it at Eagle clash from people. I never thought would say those words. They were like, I'm just going to grow more next year. That's not the answer. Like, I'm not, I didn't go to college. I'm not like an economics major or anything, but in a flooded market, the last thing you want to do is flood it more. So I scaled down. I kept the quality up. I have less overhead. I'm going to end up being more profitable. Pretty simple. Do you mind talking about (laughs) Ego Clash since you've, since you've kind of dropped that a couple of times, a lot of our viewers are newer to a lot of this stuff. So do you mind talking okay. about Ego Clash and yeah. why, why that's important? Okay, so Ego Clash is uh, put on by Third Gen Family Farms, Brandon, who is the most award-winning hash maker in the world. No questions asked. He has more awards from more competitions than anybody. Uh, when Emerald Cup started selling out in like 2017, 2018, uh, Brandon decided... Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not going to be a part of this. Uh Oh, did I lose you? You guys there? Yeah, we can hear you. What happened? All right. We can hear you, buddy. Uh, can you hear us? I feel like sometimes when they get a text or phone call, it fucks it up. I'm not sure what like happened you, there. Can you we hear, hear us you. now? We can hear you. Can you hear me? I can't hear anybody. All right, we're talking. I, this is where I come See on and somebody. I just kind of babble, 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 babble. But uh, uh, if you okay. can hear us, fall off and then and then come back on and see if yep. it works. Yep. All right, let me try unplugging that. Can anybody hear me? Should I just keep talking? Yes, we can hear you. I don't know what happened. My niece tried to call me and then I lost everything. That's that's what happened. So yeah. sometimes if you back out, okay, and everybody come can back see in. and hear me. I can't hear a thing. Okay. So leave leave uh, and come back. Try if you can again. What's going on here? Shit. Bear with me, cause leave and come back. <laughs> there we go. This is annoying with the phone. I think there must be a, a Streamyard tech issue or something. They did. They did a recent update, which had changed a few things um, and broken a few other things. You know. <laughs> I'm always, I'm never trying to be the first one to adopt a new update, but sometimes that happens. And yeah, this is the second time where an incoming phone call or text has rendered the guest uh, unable to hear. So it looks like Todd's jumping back in now. Let's add him to the stream. Anybody taking bets in the chat if he's going to hear us or not? Get him in now. Here we go. I think it works. (laughs) I I bet on him. He'll hear us. I can hear you guys now. Yeah, the old <laughs> leave and come back trick. Yeah, my my niece tried calling and it all went south from there. <laughs> That's how I knew that shit happened. It, it's happened a few times, so don't feel bad about that at all. Pardon it's me while I smoke a cigarette. Terrible. All right, where was I? Okay. I totally got sidetracked there. Man, we were we talking that. about just uh, – well, go ahead, Eagle Brian. Clash. You got a great Eagle image. Clash. There you go. Okay, so uh, Emerald Cup started selling out. Third gen pretty much is like, I'm, I'm not going to be a part of this. Uh, cause he's a hardcore Mendo boy, like, you know, Dukes of Mendo type, like they're, they're Mendo born and raised. They're hardcore Mendo. They're great guys. A lot of energy. So he started doing an invite only hash competition, 
uh, pretty much the night before Emerald Cup. It's ran every year. This was the fourth year, so obviously we missed it during COVID. Um, I say arguably because I know it's not a true statement, but arguably the best hash in the world is in that room that day. We all sit down and we all blindly judge each other's entries. The first year, everybody knew there was only a few of us, so it was super nerve-wracking. Everybody knew whose entry they were judging. So it was like, okay, we're going to judge resin ranches now. And you had to watch all your peers basically, you know, critique your stuff. It it was great. It was nothing but constructive criticism. That first ego clash really pushed the quality of hash the next year big time and it does every year so they do uh rosin and they do dry sift and full melt nobody ever enters dry sift anymore cuban he doesn't enter cuban grower and he's the dry sift god so he would probably be the only one i would maybe but i just don't think it would get judged properly so a lot of us hash makers kind of after ego clash base everything off of ego clash because we saw the best of the best and we know what we need to do to get better. So we kind of base our, you know, our whole year off of Ego Clash. I mean, ever since I've been basically planning what I'm going to do for next year, you know, it's, uh, but it really pushes the quality of hash and on both sides of the market, because you do have guys that have, uh, legal brands there. Most of them are traditional market, but there are some legal brands there. And it's just a really good time. Um, it's free. We, you just have to bring toys for the toy drive. Every year we fill a 20 foot covered trailer full of toys for that we did. They donate, I believe to the battered women's shelter in Cloverdale. And, uh, yeah, it's just a, an amazing event. It's, you know, it's one of the few things you can still go to that the culture is still there. Um, I hope that he somehow figures out how to like make it open to the public somehow. Cause I feel like it could kind of be that shining light, like Emerald cup used to be. Hey Todd, um, can you just, um, while we're at this stage right here, man, I know some people don't know what all the different types of hashes are. And you mentioned sure. dry sift, full melt, mm -hmm. You just give us a quick overview, man, just so everybody's on that same page and we'll get yeah. deeper into that. Absolutely. Okay. And I can go out to the lab too if you guys start getting tech questions and actually visually show stuff because it's hard. Some of it's hard to understand if you don't do it every day like I do without being you know, able visually see it. We love but a visual. <laughs> we will start with dry sift, which is kind of how I made my name in the industry. I'm known as dry sift Jedi, but I lost that account on Instagram like five times. So there's just no versions of it left for me to use. Um, dry sift is going to be your purest form of hash. If you ask me, nothing touches that plant except for silk screens, basically in your hands. So we take the plants, we dry them, we get them nice and crispy dry. They get ran over uh, a series of different micron screens. Um, my technique is to run them over a series of screens and then I take my rough sift pile and we use static electricity to mechanically separate the resin heads from the rest of the contaminant. So All right. Keith, let, me let me jump in there with you right quick though, yep. if I can, because Absolutely. you just took me to a point where, um, where I kind of ended on the, in, in the forums when I was going down that road of hash. I remember when the tech was using static to um, to extract the heads, and that was kind of right around the time when that was when that was jumping off. I think that's pretty dope. Yeah, that was uh, I'm gonna say around 2013 to 15 is when people really started getting into the static. So my method, I you know we the some of the first ones is you just wrap a DVD player or a DVD case in parchment paper. And that going back and forth across the screen is going to create a static charge. And the resin heads will collect on the backside as you pull it across the screen. They will collect on the backside, contaminate on the front. You just brush it off into a pile to collect it. And then my method is to take that to a different size screen. And then old school carding method, which you can go on YouTube, 
search bubble man's world he's got a million different dry sift videos they're kind of old but they're still prevalent um cuban grower the master of sift i can't even begin to speak on what his technique is i have no idea i know there's only maybe a handful and that's probably on the high side of number of people that know exactly how he does it but anybody who does dry sift is chasing his quality basically and it's one of the oldest forms of hash too uh morocco that's the style they do in morocco with the screens and beating it like a drum that's dry sift hash um water hash is or uh, ice wax or melt or rosin would all be the same basically the same starting process which most of us like to work with the fresh frozen so we don't dry the cannabis we harvest it wet we trim off the uh, water leaves and a lot of the little sugar leaf ends we buck the buds down into like a nickel or quarter size and that goes straight into the freezer and then that just as a process of putting it in a can with ice and water and agitating it and then pouring it through uh, a set of screens, much like the dry sift screens, but they're bags. And we collect that up, we dry it in the freeze dryer, and then we take that and we put it into screens and we press it on the press. Me at about 180, 178 degrees for about a minute and a half. And that's where we get the rosin from. <clears throat> BHO, I can get into that too. Uh, yeah, who cares? Well, right? Did you no, see the question a, on the bottom? They wanted to know more about static tech, and I even had that in my little. Uh, I show don't. Notes how do today. I, how do I see the? Uh, it just popped up for about ten seconds. A little if you can't oh, see okay. it, we can it uh, we can relay up. the questions. Yeah. So static tech, if you could kind of talk about that, we've had a variety of people talk about it, but it's always interesting to see. Uh, no one says the same thing about it. Yeah, well, that's one of the things about dry sift. As I feel like every we all kind of have a little bit different technique that we do. Um, and things have changed a lot. So, uh, God, I'm trying to remember the guy that works for Jungle Boys. I cannot remember his Instagram. It's like G7. It's like Greg, but spelled with a seven. He does a lot of dry sift rosin. And he uses a paint roller wrapped in parchment paper to create his static. Um, people use DVD players. Uh, a rubber nitrile glove blown up like a balloon works amazingly well too to do the static. You just rub it like in an X direction and it creates a circle on the glove of just resin that's really, I feel like is more efficient than uh, the parchment paper. I feel like it, it does a little cleaner separation because when we start with dry sift, most people would call that keef these days, which technically keef is an, an ancient word. And that's what most hash, uh, cultures would call the material that's already been hashed. Basically the trash is keef. So our terminology in the cannabis industry is completely wrong, but we'll call it Keith. Most even very clean Keith is maybe 30 to 40% resin heads. So even like really clean stuff that will melt in your fingers might be 50%. We're trying to refine that down to 99.99% just resin heads. So if you take a macro of it, it's literally just heads. There is it's actually you can actually get it cleaner than water hash if you're you have a good process and you take the time it's very very time consuming and uh yeah it's a lot of time standing over screens hunched over with your back hurting <laughs> hey Tyler, it's a labor so of like, love so like you know and i like i'm always a guy that likes to mix in some technology as as it becomes available if it makes my life easier how, why is it in 2021 there's not like a static screen or a table that someone has made that's charged to kind of make this you know as much that's, as hash is being made out there that's a good question and i think uh i'm not necessarily the best to answer it i will give you what my opinion is uh somebody like skunk man sam 
who is on hash church all the time with bubble man who kind of was one of the, I guess you would credit with like the first person to bring really, really clean dry sift to the world. He claims it can be done at scale. Um, and this is a conversation I've had with a few other dry sifters like Cuban. We just don't think it's a process that can be scaled and get it as clean as we do. I personally, I've said for years that uh, every anybody can make water hash. I can teach a monkey how to pull bags. It's pretty simple. It's step A, B, C, and D. Dry sift takes a certain personality, a certain attention to detail that just everybody doesn't have. So for me personally, I just think it's one of those, I'm going to call it an art form that I'm not saying technology, there will never be technology that can do it. I just don't think there will be technology that can get it as clean as we can by hand. So you might have a technology that can get you real close. So you're, you know, you're knocking out a lot of labor hours, but to get to that, that pure six star full melt dry sift, I really think is just a labor of love that needs to be done by hand. Thank you. Well said. And I, from that explanation, I want to do dry, dry sift. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's a, uh, it, it's fun to do when you're not, you don't grow like at scale. It's, it was funner for me to do when I was <clears throat> doing smaller stuff just because I wasn't always looking, you know, now I'm always looking at mountains of material that I have to get through, you know, and I have to weigh, you know, there's, there's overhead, there's bills, you know, there's expectations of other people. If I'm working with anybody else's material, you know, that I have to deal with. So I can produce, you know, hundreds of grams of hash in basically a three hour wash session in eight hours over the screens. I'd be lucky to produce an ounce. And that's why we need to educate more because I don't think there a lot of people understand what like a labor of love this takes uh, to produce the the quality and, and keep the terps and all the things that people are expecting when they go into a dispensary. Uh, but the reality is there's really not that many people I feel like that can take it to the next level of where you almost consider it like an art form. You're uh, you're on mute, Todd. And I fully agree with that. I just don't, I just don't think there's a, a lot of people that can refine it as an art form. And then you have the big challenge of, I, 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 I can't just give it away. I mean, I'd love to, but I can't just give it away. And unfortunately dry sift, even when it was pretty popular, when Cuban was doing a lot of drops in LA of dry full melt dry sift, it was really hard to get anybody to buy it. Even after I made a name winning Emerald cup and Cuban vouching for me, it was just, it's a really hard product to sell because it, it gets really expensive. It just does. You know, it's, I, I made a post the other day how I don't think that there is any product that is worth over $100 a gram retail. Dry sift would be the only one that would maybe have that value. And then that doesn't leave you know a lot of room for people to even try it. Like, who can afford hundred and twenty dollar grams? I mean, <laughs> I can't. That's why you, <laughs> you know? gotta grow your own? <laughs> That's why I gotta grow my own. That's why I started growing my own. That was the whole reason. Was mm -hmm. literally, we would just hash the whole room, and it was basically head stash. You know, because we couldn't, you couldn't get stuff like that in Wisconsin back then. There was just no way. You know. You're lucky to get, you know, a brick of Moroccan hash. I remember in the, like in the stuff. early 2000s, there was, um, you remember um, dry ice? So you would take oh, yeah. dry ice, all your flour, shake it up in a bucket or a bag. <laughs> this <laughs> is some diesel. hood shit, bro. Right. Got yeah. my diesel, my diesel fuel, uh, mm -hmm. a micron um, strainer. Kitchen, on the kitchen shake table. It, yep. Shake it out, shake it out. And what would happen and was you would, you'd get out of the 50, it would be nice and blonde. But I know what was happening now, looking back, the dry ice was breaking the plant particles yep. into pieces that were smaller than 50 microns. Yep. So now you're getting plant 
in your yep. uh, trichome and, heads. And that, that's why I say for uh, for full melt dry sift, dry ice is an absolute no no. Never use it because there is a fine line between between creating too much contaminant. The more contaminant you make, the more cleaning you have to do. Every cleaning you do, you lose a percentage. So the more cleaning you have to do, the more you're going to lose. And like you said, you made the perfect thing that I was grinding. So dry ice was breaking some of that material down fine enough that it was going to end up on a screen you don't want it to end up on, basically. So the dry ice, yeah, you can get some nice blonde stuff if you do like a really quick pass. But there's, I don't know anybody that does like really high end dry sift that uses dry ice. No, and it's a, maybe if freeze it's blonde, it. Blonde, it's harsh. It's still harsh. Yeah. A, a lot of times harsh. it's blonde because it's mostly stalks, mm -hmm. which are very harsh on the throat. Very it's true. Hood has Marco's. And then, down and then it's a, you know, I, I say attention to detail. Yeah. <laughs> I, I can look at a pile of Keefe dry sift and I can pretty much like tell you that's mostly stalks and contaminant. Exactly. Or I can tell you that's like 90% pure. You know, just, just by looking at it and like Cuban, he's even, uh, and I, and I think I could do it now, but back in the day, he used to tell me like, uh, if I, if I have it my way and I'm judging, I'm never letting a static dry sift win. And I was like, at first I was like, well, that's kind of not really fair. But then he kept explaining it to me. He's like, look, dude, I can open a jar and I can tell you if that was mechanically separated by hand or if it was done by dry sift. So I started looking at jars and I'm like, okay, I can see what he was saying, you know? And then that's when he like unlocked a big key for me. And I'm going to just, anybody out here that's listening to dry sift, this may be the first time you hear it. It might not because it's been a few years now. Most people clean on a 200 LPI or 196 LPI. Do your final cleaning, cart it on a 180 LPI. So that 180, you're basically separating that 90 to 120 micron size head, which is your best meltiest head. On the 196, you're going to have some 70 micron in there and stuff, which isn't quite, quite as good. And it gives a little bit different look to the hash. So that's why I started doing my final process was carded on a 180 LPI. Then when I got it to Cuban's eyes, he would say that's mechanically separated, which for me was like, yes, <laughs> yes, I did it. You know, like I fooled the master kind of thing, but I did because I had to do that extra step by hand of just dragging it across the screen with a credit card basically. And what's happening is the, the resin heads are, the camera's like opposite. The resin heads are rolling across the screen like ball bearings. And that's going to help break any contaminant down smaller and smaller and smaller and push it through. So oh. resin heads dried are actually really durable. Like you're not going to crush them. You're not going to smear them unless, unless the room is too warm and they start melting. So doing that dragging, they're acting like ball bearings and they're acting like little crushers, breaking that contaminant down even finer and finer and finer until it can finally fall through that 180 LPI. And all the good resin stays on top. Smart. I didn't know they were that durable, but it makes sense. My buddy was, um, first of all, don't touch your flowers, but he was touching his flowers. And then he says, well, all of a sudden they're not as sticky. I said, well, that's because they're starting to dry. Your trichome yep. heads are drying. Yeah. Or you and don't they, touch the motherfucker so much you don't have any left. <laughs> yeah, or you touch it so much you don't have any left. Yeah, fresh cannabis, that resin head's going to just squish in your fingers. That wax membrane is just going to break down and, you know, you're going to have the sticky fingers. The dry stuff, you may get more grainy feeling and you won't get the strings. That's because it's just like you said, it's dried out. And the only way it's really going to break down is now is heat and pressure. So, you know, the heat from your fingers is obviously going to break it down over, you know, and it starts to melt. But just touching the flower, what's really going to happen is if you get the light just right, you're just going to see it snow resin. Just, it's just going to fall off, you know? Mm. So if you're, if you're small scale, one of the things I recommend doing is all of your trimming, all of your bucking, do everything over dry sip screens. And you're going to be able to collect that primo of the primo that ends up on most trim room floors. 
Which micron uh, would you write? Which like micron to trim would over? You, yeah. Uh, I would probably just trim over like a, a 125 line. Okay. Or a 110 line. I don't have my conversion chart in front of me. I used to have it memorized, so I can't really give you micron for that. I got gotcha. Because micron and dry sift is kind of a, a new thing. Like there's a lot of guys that sell dry sift screens now and they put micron size on them. Older dry sifter like me, we just we do not talk about microns. We talk about lines per inch. So oh, okay. I still, you know, I used to have those conversions memorized, but I don't anymore. So I want to say a 125 LPI is probably gonna be close to a 150, kind of like your trim tray. Yeah. Okay. But it might be a little bit smaller, so you're gonna less end up with a little less contaminant. Ideally. Ideally, you would stack a couple screens, so you would have like 196 on the bottom, 125 or 110 over that, then an 86 line, and then a 60 line on top. And what you're doing there is you're basically combining two different techniques. The 196 with the 110 and, or 125 over it, that's basically Bubble Man's technique right there. Throw all your material on the 125, collect your resin on the 196. The two screens above that now, the 86 and the 60, that's dry sift wizard tech, where you just do the quick throw material onto the screen, don't move the screens, collect what fell through, should be pretty clean. So you're kind of, those top screens, you're hopefully getting some of the contaminant to get caught. So you just end up with a little bit cleaner pro product. And what happens with that technique is resin falls like a rock. Contaminant falls like a leaf. So it goes through, all goes through the 60, but you're hoping the contaminant falls like a leaf and gets caught in the 86. Well, the resin just falls through. Um, the dry sift wizard tech works pretty good. It's just not good at producing more than like a gram, a dab at a time. And I, I, I don't know if I should even be talking about dry surf wizard, but <laughs> now you're dropping bars, uh, especially when you're, you know, talking about exact numbers and breaking things down for people because uh, Marco and I have had a in kind of a talk and a lot of the newer farmers are afraid to even experience this kind of stuff because they do have their flower. They obviously want to smoke their flower, uh, but if they make any mistakes, they might have uh, huge issues kind of trying to, um, go to the more of the concentrate levels where, you know, whatever area they want to go to, it, it is pretty scary because you just don't want to mess up, yeah. you know, your first run, your second run. And, and I'm going to, I'm going to be honest. And I'm going to say, if you have never delved into it, it should be a little scary because, you know, you see a lot of farms now because hash is more profitable. Oh, I'm just going to freeze everything. Bad move, bad move. You need to do R and D needs to go into this. I did years of R and D before anybody knew who I was, you know, nobody knew who I was. I thought I made pretty good hash at that point. So I can look at things because of my experience and I can give you an idea of how well they're going to do. If you just go and you take your OG that you've been growing for the last 10, 10 years up at your spot and you give it to somebody to process it, you're probably not going to have a good time. The processor's not going to have a good time. The farmer's not going to have a good time. So my recommendation to farmers, if they're not going to do it, they don't have the confidence to do it in-house, is find somebody you trust. Find somebody who's willing to give you paperwork back that tells you where everything went. And I'm not talking just a notepad with scribbles on it. I'm talking like a spreadsheet with 120 micron first wash, second wash, third wash, that everything gets broken down. This is what went into it. This is what came out of it. This is what bag everything was caught in. Then you'll start to get an idea and be able to trust the guy that I'm, I'm, he's not ripping me off on my splits. He's not, you know, under washing my material, I guess, is the really the only way I know to put it. Like, you know, uh, cookies and cream should hit 5%, but your wash is only hitting two, you know, like there might be a problem there. Um, in R and D give them tests, you know, we don't pull early 
but you can go and pull 2000 grams out of the field a week before harvest, even two weeks before harvest, give it to your processor. He can wash it and he can give you all the feedback back. Then you can run the numbers. Does this financially work? You know, then you can go and pull the lot. You don't want to just, I'm going to freeze this whole crop and do this with it because you're basically shooting yourself in the foot. You are. And I've heard it a lot this year. Um, this is where sometimes I get a, I get a little ornery on this subject because I've done this since day one and I've never, never gone in a different path. Even when, you know, indoor pounds, I knew people were getting like six grand for them. We didn't dry a gram because it's not what we do. We're hash makers. I make hash. This is what I do. So watching guys chase the markets where the money is gets a little annoying to somebody like me. Um, and, and it, it's unfortunate. I hate to see these guys not getting paid for the work, but at the end of the day, that's not my problem. So don't put it on me as a hash maker to give, give me crap. Let's do the proper R and D let's sit down and have the conversations we need to have. Sometimes they suck, but we, if we can be adults and, you know, realize it's just business, everybody's going to do a lot better. Just R and D R and D R and D just don't assume because it looks frosty, it's going to wash. That's one of the other big misnomers that the dry flower guys think. Oh, I got this super frosty OG. That doesn't mean anything. Some strains that hit huge numbers visually don't look like they have a lot of resin. They just don't. Like this strawberry guava that I run that hits over 6%, you would look at it and be like, there's no way it's ever going to hit 6%. But it crushes. And then the plant next to it that's just completely frosted out might hit 3 do you attribute that to the density of the heads or I mean, what is that then? Is that it, just it's, the it's the structure. So like a, a gelato, for instance, scope it. It's like a carpet of resin. It's so thick, but the stalks, I got to get used to this camera. The stalks are really short and the, the neck where the resin head connects is really fat. So that's really hard to break off. If it's got a longer, skinnier neck and a big fat head that's barely holding on, that's going to be good for hash. Um, okay, so that, it, so that with that with that short neck like that, you're actually going to leave that weight on the flower. You're gonna you're only going to maybe break the head off. That thick neck material probably we're, won't even. We're trying to just break the head off. We don't okay. want that stock to. We don't want the stock. Okay. So it, it has to do with how much, basically how many cells are connecting the resin head to the stalk at the end of the day. Okay. So if you can have a nice skinny stalk with a big head, um, I'm trying to think, Schwale, I think it is, at yes. SCH, they do macros that they measure resin heads. They measure the neck where it's connected. They measure the stalk. And it, they really have a good idea of like, yo, this is going to work. This isn't going to work. based Because they're actually... I guess doing the science behind it or collecting the info that like this measures at this, which is crazy small micron numbers. And it washes like this where a lot of us are just touching it, feeling it, testing it, you know, to get numbers. And after years of experience, I can look through a scope and I'm basically seeing the same thing they are. But we do, we generally, generally what I look for, if you look at it under a scope is you don't want a bunch of, different heights you want those stalks and the resin to kind of be even an even height but not a super short stalk like like uh gelato is just like it almost looks like the resins on the leaf surface or if you scope like a tangy it's got this really long stalk with this really big head on it that like the stalk almost can't even carry the head you know it's like almost bending like over its weight that's like those are going to just fall off and the stock is hopefully going to be left behind. And then how many stocks you get is all depends on how much agitation there is. Um, thaw times. And then everything, I always say everything is strain dependent at the end of the day, too. Uh, especially when it, especially when it comes to strains, you were, you were mentioning that you're growing your indoor and your outdoor. Uh, Marco kind of even went deeper on that with you. I know from a variety of things, people always want to kind of pick your brain on the genetics that you're running, like you had mentioned, 
when they are washing, they don't want to hit a 1%, 2%. They want, you know, everybody would love to get 6% on everything that they're doing. So are there certain breeders, certain genetics that you feel are tried or true uh, from your personal experience that people could probably go out on their own pheno hunts, uh, on their own seed hunts, and maybe try to find Absolutely. some of that magic for themselves? Absolutely. Uh, and the first person that I'm going to say is Kushkirk, Garden of Greece, breeds his own strains, grows his own strains, washes his own strains does it in a manner that everybody who grows cannabis should be striving to do it. True living soil, not, you know, bought in a bag and amended and thrown in a bed in the ground and then called living soil because they dumped a bunch of microbes in it. True organic native soil that he's built up over years, his genetics hit numbers. And they, you have a very, very good chance. I'm going to say over 50% chance out of a 10 pack finding a good washer. Um, Bloom Seed Company does pretty good. Six Star Selections is one that I like who doesn't have a very big name. Purely Melted Seed Company is another one that I just got onto this year that I really, I really like his stuff. Um, I know I'm going to miss a bunch. Uh, See Junkie Jay Breezy. He's got a lot of his strains wash. He just love him or hate him. The guy, you know, he's killing the cannabis market right now. Uh, God, who am I missing? Oh, I should, I should go dig through my seeds to see. <laughs> but there's a couple right there that are that are big hitters. Well, that's kind of, you know, we, we ask a lot of our, our guests kind of that same question because I want the audience to start to see that there's a lot of brands that are out there that maybe you don't necessarily have heard of, but you're hearing these kind of individuals like Todd mention that brand's name. So they might not be as hype as, you know, it, it seems like, for, especially when you first get into this, uh, it's hard not to fall into the hype because it's like, well, if everybody's rocking with this dude, this dude's got to be the shit. There's a reason. You look at the price point and you're like, wow, he's got to be on point, right? Uh, but sadly, a lot of that stuff, and, and it's a variety of people throughout the years have done that. You know, we always kind of joke that it's more of like a like on a hip hop level. Some people are going to be a one hit wonder with that kind of stuff. Some people are going to be around, and the ones that are actually writing their lyrics and doing the work and, and coming up with beats themselves are the ones that are going to stick around because people can really t people can tell when it's authentic. And when when individuals are going out of their way to say like, all right, this is some bullshit here that I grew, uh, you know. Just, just the, uh, the the truthness that I feel like when the breeders are actually putting in the work, uh, people will still rock certain genetics just because they know those maybe hidden dangers, uh, but they continue to grow certain genetics and have fun with that kind of stuff. And that's what I would like to see more of is people willing to be able to do more pheno hunts because they have kind of the a little bit of a better guidance from the breeder themselves. Yeah, and that you know that's why I said Kush Kirk Garden of Grease first is. I, I always have said in when you when you're doing cannabis and you're trying to put out a product that and I said it before, you know, that you need to do it with love and intention. Cannabis is not a plant that should be abused in any any form or fashion. We do use it for pro, uh, profit. Is that abuse? I don't necessarily think so. Um, but Kush Kirk is one of the few. I put him on a pretty high pedestal because it, he's who I'm chasing as a hash maker. It's like he said, it's not a process. It's a lifestyle. And what he does with pure love, pure intention, pure goodness in his heart, you're not going to find that in many other seed companies. Most of them nowadays, especially with the rec market hitting, are just trying to mass produce things. And um, a lot of the companies that I said, most of them I've met personally, besides for Seed Junkie. And I, uh, I know them, I guess, on a personal level, maybe not very deep, but I've met them and I see what they're about and I know how they run their business. And I see the intention that they put into their companies. And that's, for me, that's a huge factor. I know a lot of people are just, you know, numbers and, who's hype and stuff like that. But for me, it's more, you know, who's, who's truly putting the passion into it and not just doing it for the money.
you know, at the end of the day, yes, we're all here to pay our bills. Do not get me wrong with that. <laughs> okay. No, I don't but, think anybody's wrong with that. If you're putting out a quality product and people want your product, boom, right? You should be on fire. It's just when you're maybe your marketing is a little bit better than your genetics. Uh, and then behind the scenes, again, people don't always step up and say to each other because they're almost embarrassed sometimes to say like, oh, you know, this this genetic or, or this breeder or whoever. I had issues with it. Come to find out that um, so, so does a lot of other individuals. And I feel like especially when you're first starting out, man, there's so many variables to fuck up. You, you want to have sound soil. That's why I kind of preference that one. And then you definitely need sound genetics because that's where it all starts, where you can get that trained eye, start to know the difference. All right, my shit is improving week by week, month by month. Uh, and I do feel a lot of that is going to come down to genetics, where if you have just a, you know, you're, you're running the mill seeds, you're running the mill clones, the, all the stuff kind of looks the same. All the stuff kind of smells the same. It does. And I, I'm going to say like, I'm so glad I'm not trying to get into this now. I'm glad I got into it when I did because the, the cannabis industry has become uh, visual aspects sell cannabis these days. You could have a boofy smelling product in a badass packaging and these kids are going to buy it and they're going to be happy with it. And it's not the product that they're happy with. It's the brand that they're happy with. It's the packaging that they're happy with. And it looks good on their Instagram or their Snapchat or, you know, whatever platform they're using. So that's why I say I'm really glad I'm not getting into it now. And I got into it in the forum days where that information was out there and people shared that like, hey, we're running so-and-so's genetics. Nobody's bashing anybody, but bringing up the fact that like, hey, we had way too many herms. Well, then that breeder went back, took that information and he, you know, did a better job. And then his next release, everybody was like the shit's fire. And now they're huge breeders where nowadays it's like, if you come out and you, you fall on your face because the product you put out wasn't tested or whatever, it's like, you could be done. That could be it for you. You can never have another brand again because you get dragged through the meme mud. You get dragged through the Instagram mud, whatever it is. It's just with social media, it's so harsh and it's so negative. That if you don't, and like you say, you somebody might make fun of you because you grew somebody's gear that everybody doesn't know. That's the the, the dumbest concept ever to me. Like I, I'm a carpenter at heart. You know, I spent 20 years in the trades, and I always said you can learn the coolest trick from the new guy because we get tunnel vision after 20 years of doing the same job. You have tunnel vision. You only know your way of doing it. And this guy could come in and just look at it. Diff way differently than you do our brains all process things differently and just be like the simplest little trick so i never i never want to discredit anybody i never want to devalue anybody and and i and i wish that people would get off the hype in this industry and get more back to the reality because hype has created 80 percent of the product looks the same smells the same tastes the same and it's all watered down now <laughs> and it's horrible. Damn it. So my shit was my shit was fucked up, but I think Marco's is fucked up now. We can't hear you, Marco. Sorry, my shit was fucked up too. I had to leave and come back. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I was gonna say I didn't hear you there. So yeah, I wish that you know, like people would look at the small guy and the small guy could get more play and but we don't look out for each other is the thing. Like I've yeah. heard this when I've been at some of these meetings before, even that, you know, I was lucky enough to listen to a, a billionaire speak on the cannabis industry once, like in a yeah. private room. And that was the main thing he was talking about. He's like, you guys don't even trust each other. What's going to make us with, with all the money over here, want to invest yeah. in you guys. Cause you guys look like you're little, like, especially back then it was more like high schoolish, clickish drama, yep. um, you know, where these, you know, uh, and uh, we should take offense to that in a way and, and man up because those were opportunities. I feel like a lot of people probably squandered for themselves. Uh, for sure. By, and and by I'm, making I'm proud to say silly. that I'm one of few of the few hash makers and growers out here that has worked with other people and the relationship didn't end bad and has worked with other hash makers, other growers. And what comes out of that is magic, <laughs> like straight up. 
You yeah, know? When, when it works, man, it works great. You know, can it's y'all just, hear me again? Yep. Yeah, you're back you on, man. Yeah, the collabs are fantastic when it's like two people really putting in the work and the effort. You know? yep. Yeah, and it, and it doesn't even necessarily have to be a collab. I mean, it could just be, you know, two people working behind the scenes together like me and Wook Sauce used to do. Like, I had a, I had so much respect for him and, like, as a friend because – you know, we both, we were two guys who had brands that were recognized and knew what we were doing. And we started washing together and we had to basically come up with a whole new system because it was like, okay, I like what you're doing. I like what you're doing. I don't like this now that I see you do that, you know? And it was like, we came up with this whole new, like way of doing things with having two knowledgeable hash makers in the room, not just, you know, a laborer and a hash maker. And it was like all of a sudden we scaled up past what most brands were doing in a matter of a month. And like when I was telling people what we were doing for washes in a day with two guys in six hours, they were just like, you know, watched their head explode. No, we're not running a machine. We're doing it all by hand, you know, but it was just like working with him and then doing the grow together. And like, I feel like we both came out of that situation working together better at our trades than we did going in. I think when both people, man, go into it um, open minded and not trying to one up the other person, I notice a lot of the one upsmanship in the cannabis industry. Um, you know, if someone posts something, you know, then it's got to be, well, you know, my buddy did that better or I did that better. Um, uh, one thing we got to remember we can't smell, you can't smell through the screen. You can't nope. pick up Terp profile. So, if you're only going to judge something on visuals, yep. you know, that's you're doing it a, dis- a disservice, you know. So, one thing I like to do, man, if when I see something, if your first response isn't, I like that or good job, then just move on. Like, there's, you know, there's no room for, you know, going out of your way just to tell somebody, oh, I don't like that, or just to say, man, I could do that better. You know, some of those things are where we need to focus more on our own grows and our own um, yeah. skill sets and increasing our own knowledge instead of um, putting the other folks down. And I, that's one thing I love about this show and bringing on people like you, Todd. Yeah, I appreciate being on. And I, and I you know, again, I, I, I point to social media as being the root of so many of these problems that everything became one upmanship and like, yeah, oh, my buddy did it better. or My buddy did it first. And it's like, it's, nothing's new. Everything is regurgitated. There's nothing new. I don't remember who the hell it was that says that. I'm not very philosophical, philosophical and I don't read a lot, but it's a quote that I do remember that nothing is new. You know, everything is regurgitated in one form or another, basically. But it th- that's where the cannabis industry is so weird and circle back to what I was just talking about, the hype. It's the hype. It's the hype. You know, you got to be known as being the first to do something or the best to do something. And why can't you just be known as being good at what you do and being a good person doing it versus, you know, having the flash and looking the yeah, part the like it's just to everything's become so fake with build. social media is my problem sorry i didn't mean to interrupt the, no. the, um the reputation used to take a while to build up you know it was something that was earned um and then maybe that is part of social media is that you can kind of rocket yourself up uh but i feel like from a from an outsider looking in on just where we are as an industry instagram is really the only place that people are for cannabis uh, for a variety of reasons, but it seems like, you know, it it came out from Facebook and stuff that, you know, this is horrible for like, you know, teen girls, body image. Mm -hmm. So they they obviously can tell that this is fucking up society. Uh, And then I feel like from a, from our point of view uh, to really build an Instagram like yourself, Todd, to really get it past that 10,000 mark, that is a lot of effort and a lot of time, whether it's you've actually put that in on Instagram or you have the clout to be able to just come back on and, and everybody starts rocking with you again. The, the issue that I see from a lot of things from now on is that it's hard for the general public, the newer cannabis people to discern between the people that have been here putting in the work and the individuals that just have that 25,000, 100,000. And so it's like, all right, well, this person must be on point. 
And it, yep. it, behind the scenes, it is more of like a Wizard of Oz. I've always kind of mm -hmm. joked about that. Um, you know, a lot of people don't want you to see behind the curtain. And, and that's why I'm transparent. And I've always tried to be transparent when I, like I said, when I was trying to hustle, you know, backpack rosin in Sacramento and nobody knew what it was. I, you know, I remember my partner at the time who, you know, I don't know where he is now. <laughs> he went crazy on me, went bipolar, and kicked me out of the house. But I told, remember telling him like, all right, dude, our biggest goal now is education. We have to be as transparent as we can and we have to educate as much as we can because the only way we're going to be able to educate is being transparent so people can actually see how this is done and start to trust it. And I think being transparent is what has gotten me to where I am now. It's the, you know, being DQ'd at Emerald Cup and getting first and second taken away from you. But instead of hiding from it or running from it, being like, look, we all dealt with this this year. We all dealt with russet mites that year. It was like everybody just got fucking hammered and nobody knew what to do about it. Like everybody was just spraying whatever. Tim Blake was telling me I used Pyganic all season. I had no idea we couldn't use it. Nobody even knew that there was an approved list of pesticides. So that's where me and Joey were like, all right, dude, this is like a huge educational point for the entire industry, not just us. And I had, I had people, I remember them on hash church talking about my DQ being like, there's no way it was for py pyrethrin. Like it had to be Eagle 20 or something. No, it was, it was pyrethrin dude from chrysanthemum flowers that no longer can be used on cannabis in California. It's just that simple. Everybody was still spraying it. So we were in the Emerald grown co-op at the time where we would get to meet, we would get to do meetings with you know, potentially a hundred farmers were in this co-op. So, uh, you know, we got put on a pedestal again, like, Hey, you should listen to Todd and Joey's story because they just lost two Emerald cups for Pyganic and people in the room still didn't believe it that like you could lose it for that. So instead, you know, instead of hiding from it, we were just completely transparent. Yes, this is what we did. We didn't know we were doing anything wrong. You know, we educated ourselves. We educated educated a bunch of other people. And then we went into the next season and we didn't spray a damn thing. We did, you know, predator bugs. And then you saw a lot of people doing predator bugs. And now everybody's growing clean cannabis. You know, you just it, be transparent, educate. That's why I try to show as much as I reasonably can of my grows is one, so that people can learn. And two, so that people at the end of the year, when they start getting these jars, I have had more this year than ever. People hit me back being like, dude, you don't know how special it is to have watched you grow that all season and then get to try it versus, oh, it's just another ice cream cake. No, that, or, you know, it's just another gorilla glue. No, that's the gorilla glue that I watched Todd put in a bad soil, have to take it out, replant it do all this stuff to get aphids on the pumpkin plant next to it, you know, all that stuff. And then they get it in the end and they get to try it and it makes it so much more special and it makes yep. you way more legit in the industry. And no, it, it does not happen yeah. overnight. A lot of people, I walk into a room and a lot of people call me an OG and I'm like, why dude i'm not like this industry was built when i got here i just came out here and stood on the shoulders of people like joey the humble local you know who really put it on the line to do it like i'm not an og though i had somebody explain to me like no dude you are because you're one of the first non-solvent guys and you've you know you've never frayed but i we're we're losing that we're losing that like you were saying nobody knows who to look up to anymore because Jim Bob could have started an Instagram, bought a hundred thousand followers, have all this fancy, fancy packaging. Yeah. He, it looks like he's crushing, but what is he actually doing? Anything, you know, do you ever see his grow? No. Do you ever see nope. that he has problems? No. Nope. I say, I show what I reasonably can because unfortunately in this Instagram world, you can't show some problems because you're going to get dragged through the mud even though you're being transparent and you're going to go and show people how to fix that problem you still just get memed to death because you got pm or something which is like 
Yeah. It's ridiculous. When I started working with farmers, my first question would be, what did you spray? And I'd get this blank look or a no, I don't spray anything. And that's where I would be like, all right, I'm not working with you. And then they, they couldn't figure out why. And I would tell them later, like, look, dude, I'm a farmer first at the end of the day. I've dealt with it all. I've seen it all. You kind of don't get to do an outdoor crop without spraying, using something, something. you know? So like, just be honest. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Transparent. Who don't try to play games. Yeah. That's one thing I think reason you got such a big following, man. Um, and for people out there, he does most of his work on stories, you know, so yes. you got to follow him. And I, that's how I do a lot of mine. I, um, I, I kind of, uh, wanted to go do a little bit more posting too. So it kind of sets permanent. Um, but yeah, he does a lot of, more. yeah, but the, the stories are wonderful and you got to keep up, man. A man is doing a lot of things. Um, real quick, give me the, um, story behind the flipping of the eggs because it shit, I'll be, I've been flipping them too, bro. Watching <laughs> you guys. <laughs> I got to give, I got to give credit to my boy Wally farms for that one. Oh, shout uh, out to Wally. I know him. Cool. He used to be Wally Dabs. I think he got that account back recently. Uh, he he started that. He was flipping eggs on his story. And we started doing like videos of him like trying to flip an egg while riding a bike wearing a mask and stuff like that. And I don't know what happened that he just hasn't really kept it up. But I just kept flipping eggs. And it's turned into this whole thing again. You know, five DMs a day of people flipping eggs people love the egg flip videos i don't know why honestly it's like they get some of the that and my cat they get some of the most views you know this guy over here everybody loves oh yeah and the egg flips they're i don't know they're just fun i guess yeah they are i was <laughs> doing them myself i'm like damn, that's pretty cool <laughs> but i gotta start critiquing them though because uh, when I repost people's egg flip videos, it's amazing how many people will comment on like, oh, that egg's overcooked or doesn't count because the yolk was cooked before he even flipped it, you know, <laughs> or you broke stuff the like yolk. that. <laughs> yeah. Or, oh, he broke that yolk. He just hit it on the camera, you know. So I want to start doing them like critiquing them a little bit. But yeah, we just kind of, you know, we try to have fun. That's at the end of the day, I I'm a type of person that realizes still that like Instagram is entertainment. And mm -hmm. let's not forget that. Like, there's few things that will piss me off on there. You know, if somebody does, talk, nobody ever talks shit about me. But if somebody does, I'm probably going to repost it, honestly. And mm -hmm. like, hey, that's pretty funny, you know. But I also don't really give anybody a reason to talk shit about me either. So <laughs> they'll find a reason. <laughs> yeah. But that, and that, yeah. After thing, today, though, somebody, somebody industry. won't like you. Yeah. Somebody won't like me. I've said something on here that, you know, I was too honest or something. But that's my thing is it just let's just be honest about what we're doing. Honesty is the thing I think people crave now. There's yeah. So many people are afraid to offend anybody that when someone just speaks authentic. Um, and, and I want to preface that with like not being out of pocket or just saying things to get other people to get pissed off. I'm just saying, like, say how you personally feel. Uh, not many people do that anymore. No. And, it, you know, I don't. It's, it's a, I always say generational thing. I don't know if it's because I was that last generation. You know, I was born in 79. I was that last generation to not grow up on a computer, not grow up with phones in my pocket, you know? So I really, I just try to keep my feet planted in reality, man, that like, this is entertainment. I don't know this guy on any personal level. Why would I let what he just said about me bother me? I don't know this guy at all. You know, like mm -hmm. if it's somebody I personally know, yeah, I might take some offense to it. I might have to say something, but it's like, you know, I, 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 I get it so rarely, but like I had somebody call me a piece of shit one time for something on Instagram. And I was just like, wow, dude, you're really barking up the wrong tree. You obviously don't watch my stories because you wouldn't like it's so obviously I'm not a piece of shit human being, you know, so it's just like. Uh, you know, in one ear and out the other. Like, I'm not going to let this bother me, dude. It's entertainment. And I wish people would remember that, that like, this is all entertainment. Because what I've seen the cannabis industry turn into since I got to California in 2015. And I, again, I blame Instagram for a lot of it because I don't know why the cannabis industry migrated so hard to Instagram. But it was like, you couldn't build a brand like Resin Ranch without an Instagram account. I still don't think you could. 
it's just it's changed it so much that it's like i just i truly believe that this plant can save the world i really do at the end of the day there's so many uses for it you know we've gotten so far away from living on the earth that we live and within it versus against it and pharmaceuticals. I just, I, it could go into a million different facets of what cannabis could change and save, but the way we don't trust each other and the way we're constantly battling each other, like that billionaire said, well, how are we going to invest in this? Like it's a fucking mess and you guys are all at each other's throats where if we, we all work together, we could change the world. We could change big egg. We could save the soil. We could save the topsoil. Like we could save the whole fricking planet with cannabis if we just and that dude turn off the that. dump switch. He owned a bison ranch. Yeah, the yeah. billionaire guy. That's how much money this dude. He had a bison ranch. It was called Buffalo. It was a product sold at natural grocers here in um, in Colorado and I think a couple other states at the time. So a product that's out there. And I felt like my team, when we were representing the team that we were under, the banner uh, looked like a bunch of clowns where people probably would have, you know, done a variety of things to try to get a meeting like that. So yeah. it, was just, it was really eye opening to me on how far away we actually were on. Yeah. OK, these people have a certain skill set, but yet they, they still need money. And then I felt mm -hmm. like the real ones that were taking the time to invest and lose money like this gentleman. Uh, he understood that he needed people like that. He needed the hoodies to be successful because yep. there were so many other indiv individuals at that time, especially claiming they could do this, claiming they could do that. So then once they were given the Ferrari, it came out pretty clear that they couldn't even drive a stick. And so hmm. the billionaires were getting, obviously, and, and other individuals were putting a lot of money into people that were uh, basically bullshitting their way until they uh, couldn't figure, figure themselves out. And I feel like in make that it. moment, he saw that stuff. And I will never forget that moment, seeing him realize that is like, dude, we, we, we have either got to come to each other with respect and realize there's a, there's a few things that not everybody's going to see eye to eye on. Like, even when you mentioned like the KNF stuff and it, like, I almost feel like for a while there, and I hope this doesn't continue, but it was the living soil crowd and the KNF crowd. Yeah. The, like all these little camps all of a sudden. So then if you if you said anything that was maybe where the whole camp on one group said that that's not true, you know, if you even had somebody come on and, and have a debate or um, just even a dis it wasn't even a debate, just discussions I feel like we've had over the last year or so. And so many people are, are kind of resistant to that. And that blows my mind. It makes me wonder, yeah. is there not debate in school or anymore? Do not people, I mean, that was the kind of, I don't think there is. That was what people I no. felt like were respect, right? Because Marco, especially when you were in your prime, buddy, I bet you could intimidate the fuck out of people. But it yeah. was really the spoken word that people really respect is like when somebody would be able to crush you, but at the same time was able to like articulate and kind of scare you in that manner, like a Debo in a, in a sense, you know? <laughs> well, you know, Brian, that's like um, these days, that's called bullying, you know? Um, yeah. It's changed, bro. Like even, man, throughout my whole like career i've always been like i'm i'm kind of hot-headed you know it's just that's just, just me so i'm out on a job site um you know i manage these construction projects so i'm responsible for all this material and shit i don't have to install it but our guys do and it's our company's material see a guy just blatantly abusing our finished material using it as a workstation i roll up and I'm not small. I'm 6'3", big guy. And I was to get <laughs> some bass in my voice and say, hey, you know, you can't do that. You know, that's finished material. You know, just some, probably some cuss words mixed in there with it. Well, <laughs> now, in 20 years ago in construction, that was happening every day, all day. Belly bumping, you know, pushing people. Now, it called me up to the um, general contractor's office. This guy felt threatened. Um, so I had to mo pretty much a issue an apology. Sorry, sir, for, you know, talking to you in that tone, but it's a whole different world now, man. Whereas like in my world, it's like his boss should have jumped on his ass yeah. for tearing up my stuff. Absolutely. dude. But his boss came to me and was like, Hey man, you can't yell at my guys. See, that's, that's the world we live in right now. Yep. And that's kind of a sad place for old guys like me. Cause I, we're like the last of the dying breed i think man. i'm sad to hear that it's like that on a job site these days man and i'm talking a big job site 
20 stories yeah okay men you know like yeah. big shit it's not they no got little hr stuff. <laughs> exactly so that's i so didn't just... work on many of those <laughs> but still like you know what i would have said about that guy that dude should probably quit his job he ain't gonna make it in construction that's exactly this that's what i said when we had this little talk and i said hey guys we want our business to be a professional business and this goes for whatever we're talking about we want all the members to be professional and guys that are in here should know the basics yeah no different absolutely. than him hemp or cannabis or anything if you know the basics and the fundamentals it's going to be a stronger uh community mm -hmm. or, or job site so all right we got a question here Boom. i see it what do i think about the best way to harvest to harvest a plant resin doesn't all ripen together so do i do whole plant i do whole plant fresh frozen it is what i prefer uh used to work with a lot of dry material um, and I used to not like fresh frozen, but it was because I hadn't found the proper strains to work with. Not again, this isn't something that everything works for. Um, best way to harvest. I like to, I like to go pretty mature. I don't like this early harvest thing. I don't know why it's even talked about in hash anymore. I really don't know people that do it. Uh, the way I word it is that we don't harvest early, but we harvest earlier than you would harvest for dried flour. For dried flour, you really want to let it amber out. You really want to let that nug get on as much weight as you can because the flour market is tanked and you want to get as much weight as you can. And you want that flour to have a nice effect. For hash, I'm not going to let, I'm not harvesting it early, but I'm going to harvest it earlier than I would for flour. Everything has an application and a window you want to get it in. Um, I shoot for hash. I shoot for a minimum of about 10% amber heads. I want almost zero clear, mostly white, some amber. Then you're going to, you're going to end up with a nice light colored hash. If it's a good plant, good hash strain, and you're going to end up with a good effect in the end. You're not going to just end up with a great looking hash that has no oomph behind it. Um, I like to start at the bottom and work my way up. That way I'm not bringing a bladder in and beating up side buds and stuff. So we start at the bottom. We work our way up. We don't do anything too special. Uh, we don't try to take huge chunks at a time. And we try to only take enough so that we can get 1,000 grams from the plant to the processing table to the freezer in about an hour. Um, I don't think that that's necessary but I've had conversations with people that have let it sit longer and have done it. So it's in, in 30 minutes and they, you know, we, we all feel that there, it's a little bit better product. If you get it, the quicker you get it in there. Now I do want to say freezing is not necessary. This is the question I get asked one of the most about fresh frozen. No, you do not have to freeze your cannabis. Freezing it is more for logistics. It's for storage. It's for travel. It's for that kind of stuff. If you actually are set up and have a big enough crew, you could take a plant straight to the washroom and wash it. Boom. Good to go. You're going to have basically the same thing. When I, I'm getting a little off harvesting, but when I do my wash, I'll thaw, fully thaw that material. So freezing it really isn't a necessity. It's more for logistics. But we start at the bottom. Kind of keep the branches shorter so somebody can, one person can manage it and they're not flopping over and hitting the table or the ground because then you're going to be picking up dirt. We keep an extremely clean surface. We use uh, the fold out card tables you get from, you know, Home Depot or whatever. We wipe it clean with alcohol before uh, any strain hits it. We wipe it clean with alcohol basically anytime the table gets emptied off just to ensure a clean surface. Not crazy necessary, but I'm going for full melt. So I don't want any extra contaminant going on that. Uh, we just break it down, take it to the tables. Uh, I try not to stack a ton. So I stack them vertically in the totes, this camera. So they're sticking up, you know, standing on end. Uh, we have one person or two person deleafing. So you're getting all the fans off. Then we go through with the scissors and we trim them back to a I'm going to say quarter to half inch from the bud, depending on the strain. 
So you all you want left is sugar leaf and leaf with resin on it. Okay, you will get any leaf that doesn't have resin off, you're going to have less contaminant in your wash. Most of the dirt and dust that's collecting from the air is going to be sitting on those big fan leaves, you know, and on the leaf surface. And then we just, uh, that goes to another pile where somebody is bucking. We lay them all in the same direction so that it's super easy to just grab the next branch and you're not, the less you can have the resin hitting things or piling on top of each other or handling it, the better. So we try to hold it at the bottom if you can, and then buck it from the bottom up the same you would if you're doing flower. You don't want to cut into the bud. You want to get it right off that main stem at the base. If you're just hacking through buds, you're just releasing chlorophyll, which is going to hurt yield. It's going to hurt taste. It's going to hurt color. It could make a product that's a little harsh on the throat in the end. <clears throat> okay, so just, you don't. I'm sorry. Let me just jump in. So, you, so you don't even want to um, open up the interior of that of those leaves because you don't want any of that chlorophyll being extracted coming out. Uh, that's the the leaf tips aren't as bad as okay. cutting through the bud, okay. and you'll see it if you you know take a take a a wet branch and start cutting at different parts of it, and you'll see how much juice is on the scissors. You know, like you cut through a bud, you'll actually have like water almost sitting on there, like greenish water. Yeah. <clears throat> Where the leaf, yeah. But absolutely, you want to use sharp scissors. Don't be using dull stuff. Where you, you know, you want a clean cut. You don't want a mashing cut or a tearing type thing. And then we just bag it. We bag it in turkey bags and then into the freezer. Some people do vac seal. If you vac seal, you do not want to compact it. You want it so that when you open it, it's all going to still dump out in individual buds. Because obviously anything that got compacted, there's resin that got mashed as well. And then when you get to the wash, if you have to break that brick apart, you're anything, anytime cannabis is frozen and you're touching it and breaking it, you're grinding it into smaller pieces. When it thaws, it's not going to grind into smaller pieces. What's temps am I running in my freezer? Uh, I'm not sure what the freezers are at. My cold room, though, I wash between uh, like 33 and 38 degrees usually. Um, my washroom stays a little bit colder than most because I have a big-ass AC in there. And the way the AC just like, – like I'll set it at 42 and it'll go down to 33. I don't know. So I hey, tend Tyler. to wash pretty cold. So since we since we already said you know trichomes head, heads as they dry they get tough right um, and are more durable then um, don't now when you bucket and and fresh frozen aren't you having a possibility of um, destroying those heads because they're still on the soft side and here, here's something I always tell people too is yeah yes you are absolutely right but in every process of handling cannabis there's resin loss. You can try to minimize it, but don't lose sleep over it. Okay. Just it's just gonna pick your resin loss, and that's just gonna be where yeah, you there, it's gonna bit. be minimal. You you can try to collect every head as it falls. It's it's pretty minimal. I don't think you would see much of a difference in the end. And I and I got to that mode of thinking. I used to, you know, do everything over screens and try to catch everything that fell. Then I worked with Joey and I did things at scale and I quickly started to realize that like there's acceptable losses and everything and you just need to deal with it. You know, the fact that most, most farmers that grow agricultural products that we eat like corn and stuff, they tell you one third crop failure. We don't quite hit one third crop failure in cannabis. So if you see a little loss, there's a little loss. I just tell it like I, I had a Wally farms, I guess it was. When I helped him start his brand, he started coming to me with like, dude, I'm, I'm losing this here and I'm losing this here. And I was like, you know, stop chasing the quarter grams, you know, and, it's, and he, he started having a much better time. <laughs> great tip. Great tip. Hey, I, uh, before you even, uh, get, we kind of got on here, I have a, a few things where I was going to talk about your genetics and that kind of stuff, but oh, yeah. somebody that always stuck out to me, you've mentioned him several times. I think you even said that you had at least at some point direct communication was a Cuban grower. Uh, yeah. like 
you know, you'd mentioned Instagram at, at a time, there was this thing called mass roots, which was trying to be like the Instagram, at least for cannabis. And at that time, it seemed like all of the stuff that was being um, thrown about there was from mountain organics and Cuban grower. It seemed like mass roots was just uh, like all their work at, or at least when I was on that platform. And so I was hoping that maybe we could dive deeper into why do you think Cuban grower, uh, his, his stuff is just a little bit different and, he does seem to have a fan base where, you know, when people are want to go out of their way to like wear your hat, wear your t-shirt kind of thing. I feel yeah. like that, that really says something about you and about and your his, brand. his fan base is mostly people like me <laughs> that are like now have a name in the industry. He's the goat at the end of the day, even third gen, who is the most award-winning hash maker will tell you Cuban is the greatest of all time hands down period no questions asked <laughs> mm. he he takes things to a level that somebody like me who has a crazy attention to detail sometimes can't wrap my head around he's extremely smart when it comes to why he's doing what he's doing and the reasons he's doing it and he has a figured out a technique for the dry sift that i've heard stories and I've heard Archive was there when they figured this out. I'm pretty sure El Daggy was there when he figured it out, which is another reason El Daggy, I don't know if, if you've heard of Cuban, you might have heard him talk about this kid as like his mentor, you know, kind of his underling kid came up under him. And, may, and maybe two other people, but I wouldn't guarantee they were there. They might just be talking shit, you know? Uh, I'm not going to go into what I was told was his technique because I don't know how many people know and I'm not going to dare divulge information. I shouldn't be, but he has a technique for doing dry sift that I don't know about. I don't know how he does it, but he can produce it in quantities that the rest of us can't. And at a cleanliness that very few of us can. I've had a lot of people that are in the dry sift pretty much say that I'm probably the next cleanest sift when I was doing it. And when I would look at it under scope, I would always get so angry that like, why can't I get it as clean as Cuban? You know, uh, his wife is good at it and he's a very, very good grower. So he was around on the hash church days and a lot of guys like me who were watching, we weren't in California. So we were on the outside watching in, we're watching Cuban grower every weekend talk and you know he got noticed because of one of the dna guys like was showing off a bag of sift somewhere in oregon or something and a random dude was like you think you got sift check this out you know and it was some cuban shit and he won all these awards and then the way my story goes with cuban and why i talk about him all the time and why i hold him in such high regards is when i got out here and i started the resin ranch thing and we were running around sack. The part I left out is that my business partner went crazy. We thought he was smoking meth. Turns out he was bipolar. He kicked me out of the house, kicked somebody else out of the house. I was on like my last $2,000 living out of hotels and went to Emerald Cup in 2015 to gift my hash to hash makers. I knew from watching, watching Hash Church that the best way to break into this club was to go meet these people in person and gift, give them hash and have them see it. Well, most people blew me off, which was very disappointing at the time, but now I get it because since then I've been gifted so much hash, it's kind of ridiculous. And a lot of the times it's not that great, but because I dealt with what I dealt with, I tried to give those people the time of day and still hear what to have to say and still give them feedback. Most people ignored me. Frenchie ignored me. Uh, Jibs ignored me. Love those guys. Nothing but respect at this point. But I was like so disappointed that day that like nobody was even looking at it. Saw Cuban sitting on a picnic table, taking dabs with some of his friends and his wife. And was like, that's the one guy here that I didn't see that I wanted to see. And I had brought dry sift and he's the dry sift guy. So I have to go introduce myself and give this to him. And they kind of blew me off too. But he opened the jar as I walked away. 
And he chased me down and grabbed me and was like, who the hell are you, dude? <laughs> you know, and I'm like, I'm Todd, man. I, I just moved out here from Wisconsin. And he sat me down and proceeded to tell me that, like, I don't think you realize how good a hash you just gave me, dude. Like, I just I would just voted the Emerald Cup and I guarantee you would have beat every entry. Oh hands my God. down no question asked you know and i'm just like what the fuck you know that's a chill bump moment right there yeah I'm i like, can still get <laughs> some chill bumps dude i love this and shit, man. i don't know if he would remember it the same way as i do you know because i was in a pretty bad place at the time he pulled me aside and he said something to me along the lines like i can tell you're having a hard time right now and he was like dude i've made cup entries in hotels because it's what i had to do and he was like, you need to pursue this. That's what he said. You need to pursue this because you're good at this. I left Emerald Cup. Uh, I mean, I, I, dude, I walked away and I was, I fucking went in the corner and I cried, dude. Straight up bawling like a baby. <laughs> you know, the guy I was looking up to the most in the world at that time acknowledged me, told me he saw me having a good time and pursue it. And that was it. I went and bought an RV. I went up to Humboldt. We started getting after it, you know, gave me a shout out on hash church that weekend. I think it was hash church number 65 that like, yo, the star of the weekend was this resin ranch kid, like brought us this amazing <laughs> SIF. Next thing I know, the doors to the kingdom were open. That's all it took was a guy like him basically telling everybody you need to accept this guy. You know, so I still to this day say I probably wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that, that interaction and that conversation. I was, my plan was to go back to the hotel, pack my shit, go back to Wisconsin because I knew I had an income there because I had just walked away from a sex, successful construction company and I had work waiting for me. Like I still had customers calling me, you know, so it was like. Fuck this weed thing. Fuck California. I'm out of here. <laughs> and five, six years later, now here I am, you know, with my own property in Grass Valley. And great, man. That's awesome, man. The accolades of all my peers, which is. But you know what, bro? It's cooler. from your hard work, man. You know, you did. Oh, that. yeah. You know what I mean? I, you, I and, will and you have the balls to that. go up to them guys and say, hey, man, here's my product. I put my heart into it and I feel like it's quality. And you and you and you gave them you did that, man. So and that's shit on you. Thank you, because that's part of it that a lot of people don't wrap their heads around. Uh, not everybody's good in a social setting. I had a lot of social anxiety back then. And going that day and being in the mental state I was and still going up and introducing myself to strangers was a very hard thing to do for me. It was. And doing it and then having to do 215 cannabis events, because that was really how you did your thing back then. That was kind of how you made your income was being able to see your customer directly. And now I have zero social anxiety, <laughs> you know, like cannabis and cannabis events completely gave me a whole new there another mental outlook you know i feel like i still have social anxiety when everybody gets together it just seems like there's just so much going on um but i i feel what you mean like before we would do these shows and stuff i used to get so nervous i would shake and before yeah. you know i feel like maybe just the more that we hopefully we can have more events the one that we have in uh, denver unfortunately is not going to happen because the gentleman passed away so it's like okay that was a big piece, I feel like, at least for our state of the community. And then to have COVID and then to have uh, we had this other uh, place uh, where you could smoke cannabis and have events. And here in Denver, you know, besides that place and maybe a, a handful of others, you're not allowed to do that. And so okay. I, I feel like behind the scenes, 2022 is going to kind of reveal uh, how Denver really feels about community and weed and stuff, because there's not really anybody. I don't know how where you guys are at, but there's. Hardly anybody, maybe maybe warranted, maybe people are afraid, but to have any kind of large event um, is, is not being done. Yeah, Prop 64 killed it in California. Killed it. 
you cannot do events like you used to do. Everybody now has to have the retail license to sell. And we used to be able to go to Area 101, Tim Blake's place. You'd have 20 booths set up every weekend. It was a cannabis farmer's market. And the the culture in California fully lived on the backs of those small events. There was high times too. Like somebody like me could get a booth at a high times cup, you know, because I had a seller's permit and I had an EIN number. Like that's all you needed in the 215 days. Now you need all this crazy stuff and they outlawed the events unless it's done like Emerald Cup. So that is a huge factor of this industry going south like it has, I believe, because we don't get to interact with each other the way we used to. And that's another reason I look so forward to Eagle Clash every year. I'm not there to like, I, trust me, I would love to win, but like, I don't put as much effort into winning as other people because for me, it's not about the competition, it's about the people I get to see that I don't get to see anymore because we don't get to do these events every weekend. Like, it used to be 2017, 2016, every weekend we were at a different location, setting up our booth, hustling hash over the table to whoever showed up, you know? And it was a great thing. It was it was amazing. And I'm so thankful I got to at least even witness the the end of that. But the the atmosphere that is out here now when it comes to events is sad. That's all I gotta say. So maybe where Marco is at, because it seems like when a, when a newer state opens up, there's a spark, there's excitement yep. there. And then of course it'll flatline as the years go by. Uh, so maybe Marco, you're to turn to to maybe see if there's uh, cannabis events that start to pop up in your area. Yeah, man, I've actually um, we do we have a couple small ones. We have um, the two uh, local grow shops, grow shops that um, do some meet and greets about once a week. But um, <clears throat> I'm looking forward to doing some things, man, down the road, some growers cups, some things like that, man, home growers. I mean, I want to. I want to. I want Virginia to kind of have its own, have its feet firmly planted before all these other folks come in, you know. And hopefully, um, people keep growing quality, and we can do that. Probably um, have a fall off. To, the sound just kicks off. Yeah. Can you hear? You can still hear me. Okay. I can hear you. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um. Sorry, but yeah, man. You still there, Todd? We don't yeah, I'm still here. Now. I just said uh, needed a personal moment here. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, ain't no problem. But um, yeah, man, like you said, the the they will swoop in, Brian, as soon as they smell blood, and you know, blood is a, a new state with new cannabis laws, and uh, so yeah, people yeah, need to be new aware, blood. Man. <laughs> That's right. I just and, I just but, wish that regulators would realize like have a clue what the industry is and about before they make all their regulations. Yeah. They yeah. don't talk to enough of the people that are actually, because it, it's amazing the disconnect and you would think California, they were the first doing this, right. You know, you'd think, you'd think they'd have an idea how to structure this, the disconnect from reality to policy is alarming. Oh yeah, I don't so, even understand everything on on that level, but I just see the way that people, like I almost see it on their faces and stuff, and some of their videos when there's fires, when there's just you know they're doing everything to try to do this, and then there's just something way out of the control, some kind of legislation that changes. Um, I personally saw it. Uh, I was uh, a friend of mine was trying to make um, like a cannabis labeling company, and he was putting a lot of time and effort into it, and put a lot of into. Uh, the actual product itself bought a bunch of them so he could get them cheaper and then uh the denver legislation changed everything so the packaging had to be different yep. and uh you know granted on him he, he didn't understand that but you know as a young entrepreneur it's not like you're out there trying to think of like okay so how are, how are so many different ways that i can get fucked over especially in the cannabis space because you know if you are an owner you're not allowed to write a lot of things off or there's nope. just a, a variety and then you and then you can not- succeed and you can pull a harvest and then the state's like, oh, we're going to restructure the taxes. Right. Now you owe us $45 on the pound of trim you sold for 30 So damn shame. That's what oh, happened man. this year. 
What was this in California? Is that yeah. how that jumped off? Yeah. Wow. And it's the only state and the only industry that you got to pay taxes before your product takes the shelves. At the farm, yeah. I yeah, you got to pay that. it That's at har- basically at harvest. So it might not even pass testing. It might never even make it to a sellable product, but you got to pay tax on it. So then it almost makes people w- wonder why people even want to be part of a system like that. And you, oh, yeah. It almost I mean, makes it, you just stay underground. You, you know? know, the lawmakers out here are baffled. How do we slow down the black market? Seriously? You're taxing these guys to death. This country's been over over taxation <laughs> numerous times and what happens, you know? I mean, for real, like Oak, Oakland just put out a thing that they're, they're they put a, uh, what's it called? A moratorium on taxes this year or something that they don't have to pay their taxes because they realize we're not going to have any tax to collect next year if we collect taxes this year because everybody's going to be out of business. Mm-mm-mm. It's just like, it's, I don't, I don't understand how they, the legal guys do it. Like I stepped over on that side for a little bit. Like just, you were talking about the packaging that you go through all this effort, you know, to do all this and then boom, they just change the regulations. Well, the packaging regulations in California have changed. Like they change like every three months and now, Oh, you got to recall packaging to change it, to put it back out. It's like, what? You know, and this has to be on the main panel. This has to be on the panel B, like so many different regulations just on the packaging alone that it's like we spent months going back and forth to design packaging to then have to change it again because they threw another. Oh, here's another one. (laughs) You know, it's just I I don't know what's going to, I know where it's going to go and what's going to happen. It's going to be out of our hands and it's going to be your Marlboros and your Millers and your Coors running the show. But I hopefully agree. with, with uh, like Peter's platform and other platforms and stuff, they'll at least be an educated consumer that goes in there asking for certain things. The Bingo. craft market will, it, it's going to, I predict it being a lot like beer. You, you know, for years, your Millers, your Budweiser's, your Coors ran the show. And then when people started getting a little more hip to like organic and small batch and craft, your, you know, your craft uh, breweries now, you know, really do well. And your, you know, small distilleries really do well. I think we're going to go through a period of big money taking it over. And then you'll start to see the craft quality products start rising to the top again and be as the consumer gets educated that that's going to be what they start migrating to versus just your tuna can of, you know, mids. Yeah. Well said that's where, yeah, they go hand in hand education and with the consumer and then the farmers growing the quality, staying in that zone of craft. Don't let, don't be tempted to go cheap with it because it's, you know, you want to cut costs. There's other places to cut costs and it's not with the quality of the end nope. product. Nope. And stop Streamline apologizing for being a small farm. Yeah. Every small farm farmer I meet there. That's like one of the first things that come out of their mouth. Now I'm not the biggest farm and I, I want those individuals to know that that is the thing that I feel like everyone is craving to hear. This is a family owned farm. We are working our best to try to make this happen. Obviously, you don't see them riding around and crazy stuff. It's, I feel like it's a community. A lot of the the farmer aspect is uh, family first kind of thing. And then once you've kind of made it, I, I get like enjoy the 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 fruits of your labor. Uh, but for a lot of uh, people, for a long, long time, this was just how they would pay the, bo- the bills, and they lived just like everybody else, uh, paycheck to paycheck, if you will. Except you had to go out and take risk. Uh, sell that product you know yeah in a way you had to market yourself you had to hang out at the grow stores that was kind of like the the barber shops or something that, that just kind of established there's a whole little network that you had to do that i feel like instagram does fill that void now uh, it's just a, a necessary evil and it is the only place i know of where you can be on a platform and talk to everybody uh, that chooses to be on the platform at least yeah so- it's probably yeah is there a way to turn my camera around so it's pointing it? It's like I can point it at things. 
Absolutely. Let's uh, get, yep, look at you. Yes. <laughs> so yeah. what you want to do, you should see a toolbar on the bottom. You'll see a sprocket icon that says yep. cam mic. Click that, and that's where you'll be able to switch from front to the back camera. So, yep, switch it there and not on the actual phone itself. Must be lab time. Not the right button, but that's okay. It'll be on back a phone. It's kind of hard. Through. Fat finger. Well, it is too, right and everything. To mute and the stop cam. That's why I always, you know, like laptops too, because with yeah, with the camera phones, it's hard because everything is so condensed there. <laughs> all right, I, I'm gonna try this one more time. All right, let's see here. I see all I get when I is a, a camera and audio, but I don't see like a thing to flip it around. If you do, you, if you like click on camera itself. It should pop up another kind of side menu. Nope. <laughs> well, we'll get the That's okay. He'll, but yeah, no, he'll be back. Um, and it is for anybody who's watching this, uh, anybody who's tried to uh, no, show cool. something on a phone and not be able to see the side that you're showing, it's super hard. So yeah. yeah. I, I completely yeah, I, understand I your desire. It just kicked me out to <clears throat> the link. It does. Okay. So. Well, we've we've got the uh, incoming Peter here. I sent up the bat signal, and there we go. Because <laughs> I was going to say, if you guys, if we still have time, and you guys want, I could go out to the washroom and we can. Oh know. yeah, we'd love to. So oh, just yeah. just quickly, can, can you guys hear me? Th this is yeah. obviously the audio one, but if you click on. Go into your cam mic settings, not stop camera. Go into your cam mic settings, and then you should see a drop down that is like front camera and back camera. Yep. Hold on. Oh. Forget it. <laughs> <laughs> One more try. Yep. Yep. And you do see the cam slash mic, not the stop cam, correct? Okay. You know, who knows? That might be something with this StreamYard update. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's always fun when companies decide to uh, update their software. Uh, Let's see here. Thank you, Todd. And sorry, Todd. I was just explaining that, you know, again, StreamYard just did a, a software update. And who knows, this might be if I go and read the bug report right now, they'll be like, okay. by the way. Yeah, because literally when I hit that the spoke thing, anything yep. I push on that screen kicks me out. Okay. So, yeah, you're in the right spot. But uh, that's we'll just, a bummer. We'll just deal with it. Yep, that's a bummer. We'll work it. Yeah, we'll we this. want the lab. We want to go in the lab. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta put a jacket on. And we'll walk out there. So, you guys want to ask me any more questions or another subject while I'm getting ready here? Hey, so when you're, um, you said you got a cool room. So, is that when you're doing the, um, the bags, the um, ice wash? Uh, yeah. Is that where we're you're gonna, working all that inside a cold room? And bear with me a little bit because I had to ditch the headphones because my battery was gonna die oh yeah man we put your equipment to the test on this show we go we go to distance <laughs> and i and i'm really like the thing that makes me the most nervous about doing stuff like this is the technology yeah i'm i'm horrible with this stuff so i'll try to we all are that's why we look to chad and peter yeah. otherwise there would be no uh, show i feel like don't Marco mind couldn't even get his audio to work right before we popped there. on. Yeah, man, I'm used. I was cussing last week too. Audio was all jacked up. <laughs> Sorry, don't. So this don't is your land, that. Todd. What's that? This is your land. Yeah. Nice, so there's the dude. house behind me. That really the is the American dream. Yes, it is. I love that color on there the house. Go. Oh uh, yeah, this man's got all kinds of deer out there, all kinds of beautiful too. wildlife. Hey, Where are them big too. bucks at, Todd? What's that? Where are them big bucks at today? Dude, we haven't seen any in days. Hmm. We have the water and food out. I don't know what it is with when since it got colder. I don't know if they might go lower in elevation. 
How high are y'all up there? We're about 2,000 feet. Okay. We're right. Yeah, Sierras are right there behind me. We're 2,000 feet. So I don't know. I don't. I don't know deer in this area. I don't. Maybe they go a little lower in elevation. Stay warm, you know. They should be but in a rut ever right since now. it started getting cold, we have not seen any. Hmm. Yeah, they're we're supposed right to get now. hit with a big storm here tomorrow. All right, let's go into cold. I'm gonna just go like this. Oh, I gotta get keys. <laughs> I meant to be more prepared. That's all good. Yeah, but yeah, Brian, that's the American dream, bro. Let's get a little piece, just a little piece, man. That's all you need. Yeah, a little piece for you, your family, and build on it, improve on it, and then hopefully they can continue that process. Thank you. And we throw away so much stuff, dude. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I think I shared with you guys I'm uh, moving and all that kind of stuff. And just over the last, uh, I think I moved here in 2009. So over that time period, uh, just the junk, really. Like things I forgot about. I mean, they, they say if you haven't used it in a year, you know, get rid of it. I just feel like we're just so wasteful, man. What's the best thing you found where you were like, damn, I'm, I've been looking for that? Some old books. Like this one book, I, I try to tell her, I, I put a lot of people that I I want I want to like hopefully put on and I know that they got to go get it for themselves is this book by Malcolm Gladwell called uh, Outlier. Uh, and he talks about the 10,000 hours and how long it takes. And then he breaks down for some of it on a, a more of like almost a scientific level on why it takes so long to be good at something. Mm, dope. Ah, look at that. Right oh, yeah. Up, fully up. insulated. Okay. I see you. So, yeah, this is uh, basically all spray foam underneath, then regular insulation, and then inch and a half insulation board with a 25,000 BTU AC, and it gets cold in here like I, I was gonna say you could probably freeze in there with that much insulation with just a unit the ac unit. yeah i i could run it as a uh a freezer room so it's kind of hard because i gotta still hold the camera but my system i just do everything by hand so i got the 32 gallons on rollers um you can see when i talk about work bags that's the big work bag that fits into the can, which I probably won't be able to do all this one-handed, but this will give some of the new guys a basic idea of kind of what's what. When we talk about a work bag, that's the big guy. That's a 250 micron from uh, Rosin Evolution. These are their new bags. They sent me one to try out and I love them. Um, I've never used the ice extract work bag. It's a 220 micron, their work bag. I've never used theirs. I used to use bolt bags, their work bags, which I think I have one here. That's the bolt bag. You can see how much less screen there is on the bottom. So when you do uh, strains like GMO that dump a ton of hash and a lot of big heads, It'll just clog this whole screen. Is that a cone-shaped bottom? What's that? Is that a cone-shaped bottom on that? No, it's just because it's folded. Okay. It's just flat. It's just flat. So this one is 250 micron. So the heads pass through easier. And it has an 8-inch sidewall. So it drains a lot quicker. So... When I do like GMO before I had these, I would use no work bag. And then you have to scoop it out with this guy, a strainer, into another bucket, which is it can be fun, but it can also be a pain in the butt. So the and idea behind my, your first wash bag is just to, that gets all your what, heads and your plant material separate. Now you can start working. Yeah. So all your, all your plant material and ice would go inside the bag, inside the bucket. 
and then we lift all of that out and let it drain throw it into another bucket and then all we have left in that one that we were washing in is the water with all the resin in it it seems like it could be really heavy pulling all that ice and material out but with uh, a proper technique which i'm not gonna be able to show right now it's pretty easy so i do this all by myself and then we just take it over oh, just give me one second i gotta make sure my phone's charging here what do you do like a slow shimmy on the lift so you're not lifting too much weight of the water yeah, so you can kind of like, there's a little like shake, shimmy shake you can do as you lift it. Mm -hmm. And then really, if you, if you, you know, bend and then you just stand up, it'll lift it out of the water. You don't really want to be bending over and lifting. Just bend your legs, lift straight up. And then we take that, which would be full of water and hash. And I either just use a pitcher or a really clean five gallon bucket that only gets used for this and I'll scoop the water out and into the hash bags that are just sitting in here on a, uh, I think you can see that, on a milk crate mm -hmm. inside of this feeding trough. How many um, different stages are you gonna be washing now? How many What's different bags? How, how many different bags are you gonna go? So, um, Oh, I'll do on the first wash, which I'm trying to get more melt than anything. We'll run the 45 micron. Or is it 40? Sorry, wrong set. 40 micron. Then we do 70 on top of that. 90 on top of that. 104 on top of that. 120, 150, 180 and a 220. Now, if I'm just doing the rosin batches, which is everything after Can one, I ask a question real quick? Yeah. Can I ask you? Shoot. It, some people have stated to me that that is like a, like a, like if you're going into a vault, right? And you're, you're going through the combinations, what you just gave people, would you say that that's fair enough to say, like, I just gave you kind of the keys to the combination for you to kind of do this yourself? Uh, that, that's, that's super common. Like when you buy a set of bags, they give you a, a piece of paper in it that tells you what microns to stack and how. And you feel so you like your the suggestions are where it's at? Okay. And now here's where this might help some people. If you're ju literally just doing rosin, run the 45, the 70, the 150, and the 220. And then everything that goes to rosin is in one bag. So you have less bags to pull. Okay, okay. So let me let me jump in there. So for rosin, yeah. rosin's good. It'll take from two fifty on down. It can be considered a clean rosin. Uh, I would one fifty. Oh, one fifty. Okay. Yeah, uh, a lot of companies do. Okay, so when people say full spec, that's usually everything from one forty nine micron to forty micron. I do mixed micron, so I'm collecting 149 to 70. I always separate my 40 micron. It's kind of the lowest bag that we will collect hash in, lowest grade. I'm not saying it's bad or anything. Just for me personally, I don't feel like the flavor is as good as the other ones. So I just separate it. And, we and now does that become another product, which is a cheaper product? Yes, that's what okay. I do. A lot of people will send that off to make edibles with, but mine's still quality enough that we just sell it like in one ounce jars versus individual or two gram jars at a cheaper price. That's kind of our budget one. Okay, nice. So yeah, and then we got the you know the freeze dryer over here. Let me see. It's kind of hard with this thing. But if I just put it right there, maybe you guys can watch. And here's a, for anybody setting up a freeze dryer or doesn't know what settings to use. This should be your default screen on most freeze dryers. The new programming is a little bit different, and I don't know the new programming. But what we do is we hit customize. 
I think on the programming now, the shelf is set at 55. I like 45, so you could change it down to 45. And what you do is you hit the top left, which it's already set, so it's not going to do anything. And it will set the default to 45. So you never have to go into customize and set that again. Then we do adjust cycle times. Uh, I think it comes with a nine hour freeze time. I do five because I can easily fill this whole freeze dryer in three hours. So okay, so this I, is where you're going to dry all your sifted uh, yep. after out of the bags. Now you dry here. Now, can you do yep. this without a freeze dryer? I guess it'd just be a slower process, or do you? You risk, can. You can. I'll, I'll get into that one next. Okay. All right, cool. So the settings I like are five hour freeze, six hour dry. Now, your final dry is going to depend on how much hash you actually have in here. If this is like a super full load where every tray is just filled to the brim i would probably do like an eight hour final dry and this is where i can't really give you anybody a set number of what to run you kind of if you did six you're going to be dry but you might have to f f play with your dry times to get it the exact consistency you want like this will dry it good to press rosin, but if you want to put out, you know, in hash form, that sand melty form, it might not quite be dry enough. And this takes experience and, uh, you know, basically gramming out hash and seeing how quick it greases, seeing how quick it cakes. Those are all indications of whether or not it was fully dried. So then the, the cycles it goes through is it will freeze then it will go into what it's it says small batch cycles you don't have control over that the freeze dryer does that on its own and it will adjust how many small batch dry cycles it needs to go through by how much moisture it's reading inside the chamber the final dry is the one that we set and that's the one we have control over so Oh, I don't know if that helped anybody, but there you go. Now, air dry. You can definitely dry without a freeze dryer. The advantage to drying with a freeze dryer is it's much quicker. I can get easily 400 grams of hash dried in about a total of 12 to 14 hours and ready for packaging or rosin or whatever. Air dry, I need to get this room to about 45 degrees and 45% humidity, which mm. means when I finish washing, I have to set up a dehum in here and I have to run it for a full 24 hours to get all the moisture out of what might have absorbed into this stuff, though it's supposed to be waterproof. It's going to pick up a little moisture to suck all that moisture out of the room. And I shoot for 45 degrees, 45% humidity. And I will lay out a card table in here covered with parchment. And we take the hash and we freeze it for 24 hours in little pucks. And then we microplane it, which I'm sure most of you know what a microplane looks like. Let me just shut this door. Oh, they're kind of big. That's a microplane. Where is it? Like a zester lemon zester and we'll plane that out into a powder on the uh, parchment and we'll just leave it sit there for depending on your conditions you can do 12 to 36 hours uh i do like 24 to 30 at 45 45 um there's definitely guys that are better at air drying than me like simply adam uh pua extracts Adam says, depending on the strain and the conditions, you can get it dry in about 12 hours. But it needs to be laid so thin that, like, that whole table, I could maybe fit, like, three ounces on. Versus the freeze dryer, I can dry a full pound in the same amount of time. 
Mm. <laughs> so it's a no brainer and, when you and, step, when you get up to scale, definitely want to have a freeze yeah, dryer. That's, that's kind of the thing with the freeze dryer. And then the other advantage to the freeze dryer is rosin. Anything you air dry, no matter how cold the room is or whatever, is going to be exposed to oxygen and it's going to oxidize a little bit, which means the hash is going to get a little bit darker. Excuse me. And the rosin is going to end up a little bit darker where the freeze dryer, you get that really, really light color because there's zero oxidation because it's done under vacuum. Mm -hmm. Does that really necessarily affect the quality or is that just kind of consumer preference or we, uh, you know, we just associate it's kind of consumer light color. preference. I think it's kind of consumer preference, but after doing some batches this year where we freeze dried some and we air dried some, uh, the feedback I'm getting back is that from the true resin heads is that the freeze dried is a little bit better representation of the actual resin because it's still intact. It's still in that round resin form where the microplane, we're actually shredding them and then, you know, they're oxidizing a little bit. Mm -hmm. So okay. the air dry definitely is more shelf stable. Like it won't grease and cake as easy as the freeze dried, but everybody these days really likes that sandy, really kind of white hash, you know? And when you get yeah. that greasy, that greasy, and it has that clear liquid in there with it, um, is what, what really causes that? Is that That's just basically the wax membrane breaking down and the oil being released as it melts. Oh, okay. So it's basically, it, it's, it's pretty comparable to rosin, except the wax membrane is still all in there. So that's why it's going to leave some char behind, people call it. You know, the nail a little more dirty. Or with the, the screens, we're filtering all that, that wax membrane that holds the oil inside that resin head. We're able to filter that out. Basically, the only difference. So yeah. And I don't get crazy. Like, people want to talk about RO water and everything. I just run this big filter. We have clean a well that we've had tested three times since we moved here, and the water's really clean, so we just run a huge sediment filter, and then and just 20 gallons of our pro, which we call this our cold water reservoir. So the water we wash with goes through the filter. The water we end up rinsing the hash with, and the last thing to touch the hash is really cold RO water. Hmm. So, like, you'll have people tell you you can't make hash without RO water. I'm telling you, you can. <laughs> hmm. You just and don't want chlorinated want water. That, just put our products up next to each other. <laughs> All right. Hey, um, I guess I'm tired. If you want to head back to the house, man, um, we yeah, can finish video, up out at the house. Getting we didn't want to interrupt, but it was kind of um, the video and audio were a little uh, quirky there. Uh, but I it's okay. It he uh, he dropped out there for a second, so oh, okay. yeah, he'll be back here. He's probably running outside right now. I'll add him in when he gets back, but he he missed that part. <laughs> he's definitely good. he's definitely inspiring, man. I love his uh, the way he does things. Yeah, and just the way everything's set up. He owns it, you know. Yeah, that's, that's the other thing that I can't get across enough is just take the time. Maybe even wait a year or two if you can own it. It's so much better, especially so if you can own it yourself. You know, I, th I think there's a difference between like, you know, hiring somebody to work for you and then just being business partners with everybody you meet. When I feel like when I was younger, I, I definitely no didn't know the difference or know to discern the difference. Uh, but I think when you when it's all you and you own it, uh, that way, you know how much time and effort it actually takes to, to build it up. Yeah, uh, man. When it's it comes to cannabis, yeah, I mean, you're putting everything on the line to do this. Exactly. Uh, even I like even currently, yeah. financially, at least. Maybe not exactly. your your entire life, but financially, there's there's a lot of people that have taken huge risks, and a lot of uh, suckers, in my opinion, that fell for the hemp hype, at least here in in Colorado. Oh man, you know, some people went all in. in biomass. Man. They were talking about millions of biomass. I couldn't imagine. There's yeah. no way you're going to be able to talk about quality. Exactly. All right, Todd, you're back. Yeah, yeah, I think I yeah. just lost connection in there. No Todd's problem, back, dude. and then if you can tilt your phone to the sideways, long ways there, perfect. Yeah, All right. right on. Thank you, Todd. Oh, that's better. 
now it's right left normal okay <laughs> it's like all upside down before like <laughs> having to point this camera to the right to go left yeah, I feel like yeah, Instagram is the only thing that does vertical. Everything else in life is horizontal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's like a super basic kind of rundown of. Yeah, man, what's we get what it. In there. Yeah, we appreciate it too. You know, mm-hmm. I think a lot of people, even just being able to see the equipment that you're using or see what it actually takes to create this kind of stuff, you know? Yeah. And, you <laughs> know, like you're just... what I what I have for a cold room is pretty pretty decked out like you don't if you want to do it at home you don't need to have it quite that nice you know i'm trying to put out a product into people's hands so i want everybody to trust where it's coming from if you're just making it for yourself man get some bags get some ice get some cans do it in your garage in the winter you know that's what i did in wisconsin i i would say don't let a cold room hold you back get started get after it you're just going to learn. You're going to figure out what works, what doesn't, what temperature does, what doesn't, you know? Yeah. It's going to make you, you know, I was always taught the time to buy a tool is when you need it. And so when you, when you start doing this and you get into a situation where your cold room isn't cold enough, well, then that's when you know it's time to upgrade. It's time to do something a little bit different. You know, that's one thing about growing with a, with a hobby kind of organically or, or, you know, you're running a business. That's one thing. But for the home grower, you know, start small, grow into the business. Don't exactly. put a lot of money into it initially. You know, yep. this was, you know, this people think that this came overnight. And like you said before, mm-hmm. I put a lot of work into this. I think people that follow me see how much I work. I mean, I'm 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 just a worker. It's kind of my relaxation, you know, so mm-hmm. I like to work. So I'm. You know, I tend to find success because of that. I'm not always the best at what I do, but I never give up. So, <laughs> you know, I might take a while, but I find success eventually. But everybody thinks that they're just going to go out. And one of the things with Instagram, again, is everybody seems to be doing good at it because they never show the bad. And people don't realize that, like, none of this happened overnight for me. You know, a lot of people didn't catch wind of me until recently. A lot of people have followed me for a long time. I had a hash brand for four years before anybody really started to recognize me, you know, and it was more because I think I could have done it quicker, but I was really concentrating on the farm and running the farm up in Mendo. And then obviously getting anywhere like to Oakland, you know, is a five hour drive. Well, there's nobody up in Mendo and Humboldt. So you're not going to do that great up there. So things really didn't turn around for me and start really doing good resin ranch wise till I left the farm and focused on it, you know, but it took, it took years without that, you know, doing the farm and all that, I wouldn't be here really, you know, man, I tell you, man, Ty, like, you know, as you go through life, um, the thing is you don't really, really even notice when it happened, when you're in it, like you'll just sort of look around and say, wow, you know, I've, look what I've built, you know, around myself. So that, that that's just, just kind of goes to the point of it takes time, you know, step by step. You know, yeah. how- and, and a lot of people I don't think realize that, like, if you want to start a business and work for yourself, be ready to work. <laughs> like my work. last construction company, I worked seven days a week for 18 months. Yeah, you got to have that enough- work ethic, brother you know, enough clientele to actually support myself. So work multiple jobs, do what you got to do. And that's not for everybody. You know, it's another thing that working for yourself is not for everybody. I got to get up in the morning and motivate myself every day, you know, (laughs) Mm -hmm. but here's that toxic soil. Oh, you're going to let mother nature work it out. Yeah. We got it all cover cropped. And we're going to just kind of let it do it. figured it out a long time ago. Get rained on, hopefully leach some of that boron out with the rain. Throw some of those acorns in there too. Yeah. Do we, I got, they're all over and I got bags of them too. I just have, it's just been so busy since we finished harvesting and then getting into work, you know, and I've got, you know, not much going on here right now. A couple compost piles. Just some cover crop pots, which we're going to get your... rid of all these pots this year. Oh, you're going Hugels? 
Yeah, we're we're gonna do a uh, kind of a hybrid bed, but you know, this year we bought the place in March. We didn't move here till like April, May, so I didn't have much time to get going. So initially, I thought, oh, pots will be really easy. We'll just throw them out. You know, we'll get something going. Not expecting bad soil and having to dig them up. Anyhow, next year we're gonna do beds like this one. Oh. So this one is just on top of the dirt, but the next year we're going to excavate a little bit and then do like a hoogle, not really a mound, but like a hybrid bed so they don't stick up as high. That's right. Because you, you dig down here, instead of on top. What's that? Yep, where you dig down and now you're, most of your material is underground. Yeah, because I just don't want the plants higher, you know? Mm-hmm. Ah, oh, fuck, I'm going to... Lose you guys probably again here. Starting to lose battery. Yeah, we're getting close yeah. to the end here. We're at man. the we three mile mark. We yeah. go about three hours. If you want to make it a marathon, stuff grown <laughs> in this bed versus the pots, huge difference. Them being able to tap into the native soil, huge difference 100%. in size, health, vigor, everything. So. Yeah, that was that was the the eye opener for me that like that you just I can't be in pots. You know, I never no understood why do. more guys didn't do the um don't do open bottoms. Like I don't like the idea of the pot where now my roots can't go into the soil. You know what I mean? I, I don't know why more people don't take that approach. I feel like that was a, a simple aha moment that a lot of people missed. And then Yeah, we you know, did uh my last year in Laytonville. We did, uh, we cut holes in the bottoms of the pots, and I definitely think it helped. I don't know why I didn't do it here. I just, you know, I admit to having a lot going on <laughs> and <laughs> overlooking some things this year. So, always room for improvement, you know? Oh, yeah. I'm on year two, well, uh, going to year three on my property, man. And it's like, it's just it's each year you just got to keep grinding, man. You know, yeah. it's a little bit. Plus, each time. yeah. Our first year here, you know, we don't really know where the sun's going to track. You know, we 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 knew where we were going to grow because the last guy grew over here, you know, so it was kind of mm. obvious. But it's, you know, like you say, you got to you got to learn your spot too. you got to learn your microclimate, your sun, your soil, everything. You know, it just gets yeah. better every year. Press seed, dry seed versus wet seed. And micron spec. Uh, I mean, definitely, I don't press a lot of dry sift. Uh, when I did, uh, it tended to want to butter on the press. So I feel like you would either need to do a higher temperature to get it off the press quicker. And it usually would come out more dry. But that was, you know, I was pressing dry sift back when it you know it was nobody was doing the wet batter so it's kind of hard for me to say but then like uh microns so for pressing i do i do a 25 micron screen the hash goes in and then a 90 micron over the 25 just so you don't get blowouts it helps hold hold that inner screen together you know and then the microns can't stretch either because that's definitely another if you press too fast you can stretch that nylon and now you're not working with a 25 micron. You might actually be stretching it to a 35 micron. Mm -hmm. So containing it in that second screen definitely helps with not getting blowouts. I believe for sure. But otherwise I can't, I can't really get into much on pressing dry sift. They just didn't do it a lot. When we were doing dry sift, we were selling it as dry sift, you know? Damn. So weird. <laughs> well, if we don't have any other cool. questions, Chad, yeah. Dottie's saying Appreciate it's about that time. <laughs> yeah. Thank yeah, I'm going to die any minute. I can't seem to keep this cord plugged in. All right. Well, hey, uh, thank you for coming and joining us today. Two things, real quick, for you Caballero, awesome Power Peralta for life. Uh, yeah. Good, good hitting, my friend. And also, congratulations on thank this you morning. Guys. So, yeah, absolutely. Very cool. Yeah. I appreciate it. And yeah, anytime yeah. you guys want me, man, I I enjoy doing these. So, 
Excellent. And I guess we'll, we'll get the plug in here quick for the people Please. that don't follow me that want to at resin underscore ranch underscore extraction. And let me put that up for everybody here too. I've Where can people that. find your product? Not on shelves. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> I don't have a good answer for that one. And there you go. Yeah. If you know, yeah, you know. Is. And support, if you don't, yeah, support the small time. Find new friends. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, I mean, I, I, I tried the whole uh, legal market, and it's not a dead subject yet. But right now, I'm for the streets and the people. It's all good, so. brother. <laughs> yeah, it's all know, good. No one's judging you here on this show, dude. No. no, I know. Not on. You can't in cannabis. Hey, most of these guys paid for their facilities off of clandestine BHO labs. So. Boom. All right. So with that, uh, we will be back tomorrow uh, in the AM uh, Future Cannabis Project with Brian and Layton talking a Actually, little bit of uh, Linux. We're not. Um, Peter Peter needed to and uh, take some time off uh, for family. And then, of course, with what happened to Layton. So because we don't have a show tomorrow, if you guys will reach out to Layton, unfortunately, his girlfriend, Pauline, passed away. Uh, so we're, you know, just a little more time and uh, Peter needed some time. So we're just going to enjoy uh, you know, the holidays. Family. Happy holidays to everybody out there. And uh, I hope that you're with your family and the ones you love. Very Happy holidays, show. guys. Yep. Yeah. Happy, Happy holidays, holidays, guys. And thanks for being here time and time again. We love you, chat. And we'll see you next time.